Warning! This podcast contains spoilers, swearing, rampant, cryptid persecution, violence, gore, and sexy stuff. As such, it's for adults only. But most importantly... Transformation of this kind discussed here isn't real. So don't go fishing for radioactive fugu because of us. Violet, you're turning violet, Violet! There's no medical precedent for what's happening to you. Puny human. A naked American man stole my balloon. What? <laughs> I'm getting worse. I'm getting better. It's too late for me. But you've got to stop them. Fun in a monsieur. A waffle thin mint. Nah. Oh, sir, it's only a tiny little thin one. Now, fuck off. I'm full. Oh, sir. You're going to endanger us. You're going to endanger our client, the nice lady who paid us in advance before she became a dog. I will not be threatened by a walking meatloaf. I wish. I wish I were a fish. You chose one. By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Welcome to the third episode of the Shifty Bastards podcast. My name is Crafty. And you can call me Yaga. Together, we're making a biting mockery out of a classic that has inspired many a baby bat since 1990. It's like Supernatural, but from the monster's perspective, it was way ahead of its time, in my opinion. Yeah, but time caught up. We are returning to the Great White North to descend into the Canadian underground in the director's cut of Clive Barker's Nightbreed. Canada? Are you sure? Not one person had a Canadian accent. I thought it was in Texas. They mentioned Calgary and other places in Alberta. Besides, Texas wasn't as white as the setting of this movie. Yee-haw! Eh? Sure is shooting, don't you know? I was already a jaded gamer when this came out. So tired of being a hero and asking myself, how am I the good guy here? I welcomed the monster's perspective with open arms. I also love campy, cheesy movies. So anything that looks like a gaggle of college kids grabbed a camera and ran with it is my kind of thing. I've seen Barker's other offerings, like Candyman, Lord of Illusions, Jericho, and Hellraiser. I was expecting viscerally rendered character designs, a power-mad slasher, and overtones of mythologized religion. Oh, and spurting. Lots of spurting. That classic Barker Madness came through in spades, with his own original-ish monster mashup mythos. But it also felt vaguely trussed up like some dry humpy pilot to an oversexed TV series for young adults. But not too oversexed for you. It's possible that such a thing exists. I can tell you who would blush if he saw these stop-motion monsters. Ray Harryhausen, that's her. Okay, as an animation geek, I also blushed at the stop-motion. Ha! We are eagerly going to point out all the best practical effects. As well as the worst. Each one is their own uniquely sweaty turd blossom. And we'll tally up the clues to unravel a secret so clandestine, occult, and vaguely anti-Semitic that it makes conspiracy theorists everywhere blush at the audacity. What was lost is now found. And then lost again. Found and then lost again. Blushing. Start with a slow scroll for caveman art appreciation of a mural that will eventually be revealed to be the entire plot of the film. Critters with phobias based on them are strewn throughout. A snake, a spider, a wolf. No rats, though. If there were rats, then this really would be a noob-level dungeon crawl. Flash to a run through a foggy swamp with a bunch of cosplayers on ecstasy. To go from the sedate credits to the screaming field that looks like somebody put a GoPro on my dog was a bit surprising. I have to say, though, the porcupine lady seems kind of cool if you can get past those nostrils. The revelers run through a gate, and upon slamming Slamming it shut, the hero of our tale awakens. This man, Craig Schaefer, looks a lot like a cross between Kevin Bacon and Angel from Buffy. A bacon angel, if you will. 
The character's name is Aaron Boone. And what is with that woman hovering over him while he sleeps? He's currently being straddled by a woman, so they can have a let's get out of Calgary for a while discussion. She looks like one of those Cabbage Patch kids grew up. Which is probably why she has no headshot on IMDb. The actress's name is Anne Bobby, and we eventually find out her character's name is Lori. Lori Winston. I'm going to call her Cabbage Patch. They cuddle, and he mentions that Decker has been calling every day for the past week. She suggests he see Decker and tell him that it's all gone except for the bad dreams, which apparently aren't even that bad anymore, leaving us to presume that Decker is his therapist. Or an over-enthusiastic dom. Avoiding a dom that is too rough, I can understand. But if your doctor has been calling you every day for a week and you have not bothered to call him back, that's not a great idea. So are we sure Decker is not some spurned lover? And is it still cuckolding if Couch Patch wants to watch Bacon Angel and Decker bang? No. No, it's not. Sneak attack! Full moon! Boone comes down his spiral stairs wearing only a towel. I assume because he just took a shower. You mean the muffler spiral staircase. Why would someone make any staircases out of mufflers? He answers the phone by yelling his last name into the receiver. Is that what he said? I had thought Bacon Angel was coping with a crank collar and was getting fed up and yelled who. Boom. Who. Boom. They have some awkward flirting as Dr. Decker makes a booty call to Boone, it would seem. And it's very obvious that Boone wants out of the relationship, but is too much of a bottom and caves. They agree to meet tomorrow, but did not establish a time. Dr. P. Decker, played by David Cronenberg, looks into his briefcase and says, God help us, Aaron. There's probably horsehair butt plugs and a gimp mask in there. Turns out you're half right. Also, I was happy to see Cronenberg's involvement in this movie. I wasn't expecting to see him on this side of the camera. And while I love some of the practical effects magic he's worked over the years, like The Thing, David Cronenberg cannot act. In fact, the whole, God help us, Aaron, may as well have been, God help us, Aaron. And the gimp mask probably wouldn't do him any good anyway, even if it gave him a huge bonus to charisma. Though within the context of the film, he's supposed to be unnaturally charismatic and convincing to just about everyone, which is fascinating when you consider his actual performance. Meanwhile, in suburbia... Where Captain Hollister from Red Dwarf is wrestling with his wife in front of a hockey game on TV, saying, But I like being fat. It makes me happy. I like you fat, too. I like the positive body message about happy husky humans. I do, too. I was also busily geeking out about Red Dwarf when I figured out who Fat Dad was. The kid is awake at the top of the stairs and tells Mommy, as she stomps on her way to the kitchen, a bad man woke him. Uh, what kind of terrible parent ignores when their kid is scared and thinks there's a bad man in the house? Mom goes to the kitchen anyway and sees the back door is open. After she was just told that a bad man was in the house, what happens next is all on her. But not thinking much of it, she shuts the back door and goes to the fridge for some tomato flan or something. As she shuts the freezer door, we get a pop scare of a masked goon in a trench coat lurching out at her. And we have ourselves a slasher. Our slasher looks a lot like Mr. Gosh from Roman Dirge's Lenore, the story of a cute little dead girl. He has a black trench coat, rumpled white dress shirt, gloves, and a burlap gimp mask with button eyes and a skewed zipper mouth. At this time is closed. How does he see through the buttons? Sheer force of bloody will. It's what fuels slashers. Some condition is triggered that powers up the tenacity of murderous intelligence, bent to the sole purpose of ending you. And why does the gimp mask look like it was paper mache to his face? A slasher's gotta have an M.O. Maybe he's the papier mache slashé. He wreaks clumsy vengeance on all those who refuse to say papier mache. I'm not talking to you anymore. Mr. Gosh slashes Mom's throat so she can't scream. And as she hits the floor, Mom spews three nectarines? Like an NPC dropping health items. Then he does the same to Dad. No loot from him, though. But maybe that's a good thing, since would-be slashers may target fat people in hopes of getting loot. That would be the strangest plump positivity message ever. 
Hey, there was that story in Mozambique where the police were having problems where bald men were being killed because somehow people thought they had gold filling their heads. So this is not the weirdest thing that people will believe. Right. Bald heads have gold inside. Fatties are filled with whole fruit, which refills your health meter. I would have expected candy myself. Why go through the trouble of slashing somebody for stuff you don't want in your trick-or-treat bag? Once the parents are properly flayed, mm, he goes after the dead-eyed little kid upstairs. This kid has his mother's survival instincts. He just stays standing at the top of the stairs, watching the bad man go from room to room and then come up the stairs to him. Cut to Dirty Boone, arc welding something, because that kid's a goner. Boone's working in some garage pit when he's told he has a visitor and emerges from below to see his girlfriend, Lori. <sighs> I bet as her character unfolds, she turns out to be written as a fairy tale princess, all vapid and the only there really so she can be saved. She clearly tries to be an empowered female protagonist, but ends up flailing about randomly in her terrible sweaters as the events of the story keep her from really shining, just like those sweaters do. In this scene, however, she is standing before him in a beige leather skirt and white blouse. For this, we get a classic panning up from the floor shot as if to say, Oomph, those legs go all the way up to that bland skirt, frumpy blouse, and frizzy hair. They may as well have just played that ooh yeah by Yellow for this leering shot of Cabbage Patch, all dolled up for a rehearsal with her band. Her clean-cut appearance contrasts nicely with his grit and grime. He also rises from a pit, which is a nice bit of symbolic foreshadowing. So are we to feel that he is the dark and she is the light? He's prettier, but I think that's what they were going for. So they eat each other's faces a bit while talking about meeting up at the club where he'll finally get to see her sing. Wait, how long have they been together if this is the first time he gets to see her sing? Isn't that supposed to be her career? But it doesn't matter because this movie cares as much about her career as the next scene. After Lori leaves, cut to Boone at Dr. Decker's office. Decker says he was intrigued by Boone's talk of monsters and Midian, saying... Midian is where the monsters live. Uh, Midian? As in that place that was in the Middle East? According to the Hebrew Bible, that region was named after the fourth son of Abraham from his second wife. So with an Abrahamic tribe being mentioned as the home of the monsters, are we setting the stage for some epic 9-11 grade conspiracy action? How anti-Semitic will this get? To speak of this to anyone would bring dire consequences. All the while, Boone is intrigued by the Allen Key art in Decker's office. I kept waiting to hear a twang as he fiddles with it. Other decorations include the hanging Halloween masks from an eye party dumpster dive, a pyramid of balls on Dr. D's desk, and a painting of dance steps, all meticulously arranged and chosen by someone with severe OCD or control issues. He asked Bacon Angel what sins he wanted to be forgiven upon being taken to Midian. The doctor suggests that Boone has been committing murders without realizing it. He offers to show him the photos taken by the police and given to Decker, as well as play him the tapes of his own testimonials in therapy. Why would the police leave crime scene photos with a therapist and then have him show them to his patients? Do the police go to all local therapists to see if they have patients that would possibly do such a thing? With 8 by 10 black and white glossies, no less. Also, Decker offers to play Boone's own confessions back to him, but Boone angrily refuses for some dumb reason. The doctor says Boone's testimony matches the photographed victims. Six families killed in ten months. D ten months? I thought he said that the cops came to him two days ago to ask about this shit. For that matter, if they came by only two days ago, then why had the doctor been calling him every day for a week? The doctor shoves a bottle of pills into Boone's hand when he asks what to do. Boone chews up a handful as the doctor tells him to turn himself in within 24 hours, like he's moonlighting as a criminal lawyer or something. Uh, again, I don't know what the protocol really is, but wouldn't a doctor be obligated to try and bring a patient to the police if they felt there was a real possibility of him committing murder? Is he saying that after 24 hours he will report Bacon Angel? 
If the doctor would turn him in after 24 hours, why not now? I don't know. We don't get our answers just yet. Instead, we cut to Boone staggering back to his apartment. He tries to take more pills, but drops them in the bottle all over the floor. He takes off his shirt in front of his pinup of Babe Rainbow and a selection of well-polished hubcaps. I get that he's a mechanic, but who sets up a shrine to hubcaps? Pen past the window with stained glass shutters. Between these decorations and that muffler staircase, Bacon Angel's mom must be so impressed with his artistic side, I'm sure. He opens a drawer to remove a picture of his girlfriend. Letters, possibly love letters, a passport, a picture of himself, and assorted other personal errata. It looked to me about maybe, I don't know, 20 pieces of miscellaneous paper. Ooh, perhaps it's the secret recipe. <laughs> to what? The Colonel's secret blend of herbs and spices? If it's just personal errata, then he's been paranoid and thinks he's destroying evidence. Oh, that's not a secret. I just googled that shit. Do you really need three kinds of salt? Oh, uh, wow. More salt means more better. Also, yeah, you really just pasted the colonel's recipe into the show notes. Behold, the power of Google. Thank you. Also, uh, mind the fire. Oh, right. Boone, after dumping the contents of his dream drawer into a pile on his hardwood floor, tosses down a match that lights a line of lighter fluid like a fuse that catches the heap with a soft oomph. He sets these on fire for reasons? Super stupid, since it can catch a whole house on fire by the time that stuff actually is burnt. Bacon Angel is sitting, watching the flames from in front of his hubcap collection. While furrowing his Neanderthaline brow to remember if he has marshmallows. Suddenly, he watches a ghost of himself in tidy whities come down the spiral muffler stair and start nibbling sensually on a version of Cabbage Patch in white lingerie, which is a strapless bra and granny panties. Both of them are semi-transparent and superimposed over a similar scene with which they're out of sync, grinding toothily in front of his living room bonfire. <laughs> and to be clear, it is the living room that is is the bonfire. Music note, flight of the sensual earthworm. Also, he appears at first to be aroused, then disgusted. But mostly confused. He seemed pretty annoyed by this since it seemed to be over before anyone actually got naked. Just dry humping in a barbecue pit. I, I can only think he prematurely ejaculated. That's probably why when next we see him, it's with his head in a shower. <laughs> Trying to wash away the shame. While he washes the shame away, we take a look at Lori singing at a country western club like a young trans Joe Cocker. The song is Joni Summers' Johnny Get Angry, which goes a little bit like this. Johnny Get Angry, Johnny Get Mad. Give me the biggest lecture I ever had. I want a brave man. I want a caveman. Johnny, show me that you care, really care for me. In this song, she's telling her beau that she wants to break up just to see how he reacts hoping that he would tell her off. What a super cunty thing to do! Think about it. One afternoon, saying to your significant other, I want to see other people. Just kidding. That's what horrible people do. In spite of that little bit of mind fuckery, she genuinely seems to want the D so badly that she's willing to be dragged to bed by her hair and get knocked around a bit while being lectured to, I guess. I suppose it's fine so long as it's completely consensual and hygienic and employs a established safe word. She wants a caveman to Neanderthal over her face. This sheds more light in her encouraging the Decker Bacon Angel relationship. She's just writing a slash fiction for Fifty Shades of Brokeback Mountain. A note on the crowd at this club they're incredibly white, drowning in denim, flannel, and 10-gallon hats, so it's good to know that rednecks look the same in Canada, too. We get Bacon Angel, wearing his trademark Hanes tee and black leather jacket, wandering in, rolls his eyes, and wanders back out again. I guess he also thought the lyrics sucked. I finally get to see my baby sing, whoa, no, I can't fuck that anymore. Lori sees Boone stumble out, looking sweaty, at the end of her set. She goes back to her place, expecting him to be there, like they agreed to in the garage. When she sees he's not there, she calls his house to leave a voicemail. That's being listened to by a nefarious pigeon. While the camera is showing Boone's strangely not-burned-down apartment, there are pigeons cooing while she's leaving her message. 
We do not see the pigeon, but we hear it. And I cannot help but think that perhaps the pigeon is the one that's committing the murders and telling Bacon Angel in his sleep. Just saying. Cooing to you until you fall asleep, whispering clandestine phrases over and over. Big Bird is always watching you. A bird in the head is worth two if I see. I can see Russia from here. But where is Boone? He's staggering down a street at night with the photos of slashed families and some imagery from his Midian dream flashing by. Bacon Angel spends time with that same look on his face, the I hate having to hunt for where the cat took a protest shit one, looking around, almost wishing you don't find what you're looking for, all while flashing from dead people and the porcupine woman from his dream, and meanders into the street in front of a semi. Darwinism in action. The front grill of the truck looks a lot like the gate at Midian Cemetery for some foreshadowing of Midian careening over his life as he knows it. Which hit him so hard it made his t-shirt turn black. And what happened to his jacket? The jacket got fused into the t-shirt. And suddenly, what looks like a real doctor is checking Bacon Angel out in what I presume to be an emergency room. A nurse is going through his leather jacket and pulls out the bottle of pills. The doctor asks him what he's been taking, to which he replies, lithium. This emergency room doctor then informs him that it is not lithium, but looks to be some lab-quality hallucinogenic. Doc is very casual about drug use. A sure sign that universal health care is bound to turn your country into a nation of junky doobie heads who can't help but spliff the reefers and discard their sweater vests. Bacon Angel is then told he's on a bad trip. On a side note, is that a thing that doctors can do? I know pills are color-coded and shaped for ease of ID, but I thought that was to tell, say, Xanax from Viagra, not what is in a mystery pill without chemical analysis. He probably got extra information from Boone's examination and testimony. There you go. Making sense. Bacon Angel proceeds to try and sleep off his trip in the hospital, since it seems like he has had no ill effects from the 18-wheeler to the face. Dr. Pecker's voice echoes in his head, six families killed in ten months. He's wakened, however, by a man who's groveling for the storm outside the window to take him to Midian. This apparent madman plays coy about Midian, but then divulges that this is where the monsters go, and it takes the pain away. Our hero then volunteers, they give forgiveness too. I have to wonder, do they also validate parking and offer coupons? That's when long-haired paranoid rehab Steve Buscemi pulls out some dull-as-fuck chrome thumb blades. Which look totally plastic. After deciding Bacon Angel is a rep from Midian, Chrome Thumb says they only take you if you're worthy, and then implies they kill anyone who isn't. While this character's name is supposed to be Narcissus, as played by Hugh Ross, I like Chrome Thumbs better. And when did they say Narcissus's name? Almost never. IMDB again, huh? You cheater. Feel the power! Mm. Bacon Angel asks if Chrome Thumbs knows where it is and then offers to go there together. Chrome Thumbs kneels and grips his arms. They sent you. They sent you to take me. Boone smiles and says, yes, like a liar, placing his hands on either side of Chrome Thumbs' face, which is kind of creepy. But... I need to know where it is. Chrome Thumbs then gives directions to Midian. Well, that was easy. Although, if this is a place that has upset Bacon Angel so much that he felt the need to speak to a therapist, shouldn't he have, like, tried to look that up by now? While the original was in the Middle East, this one was in driving distance, damn it. There were no Google Maps in 1990. For a while on Google Maps, if you looked for Mordor, you would get a message One does not simply walk into Mordor. Hmm? Well, maybe they did have Google Maps back in 1990, if they had them all the way back in Middle Earth. Thumbs thinks it's a test, looks out into the storm-shrouded Alberta and says, North of Athabasca, east of Peace River, north of Dwyer. The comic also says, near Sheerneck. Comic? You broke the canon of the movie for the canon of the comic? You heathen! Oh, it's all canon, baby. Lies! Next you'll tell me books, movies, games, cartoons, and comics for Star Wars are all canon, too. Only if the reanimated head of Walt Disney decrees it. Thumbs now decides that he needs to show his true face. My true face? That's what these thumb blades are for! 
I'm an actor, you see? There's a face beneath this face. He raises the blades to his receding widow's peak and proceeds to peel his own head like an orange in the most prop comical way. The thumb blade on his left hand is not even close to the skin and the right is barely touching and is squirting stage blood all over his face. Smash cut to Dr. Pecker and the first black person in the film, Detective Joyce Hugh Quarshie. One of the few people of color in this movie, but also the one with the most screen time. This is why I shall dub him Detective Token. Aww, I wanted to name him McGruff, since that was his character's inspiration. He had the trench coat and everything. Ugh, you always get to name them. Fine, we'll compromise. Detective Token McGruff. Deal. Detective Token McGruff and Dr. Pecker are also marching down the hall with the ER doctor and two policemen. Uh, police? Are you sure there were not two valets behind them? That's not how we talk about the uniformed authorities of other nations. These men are all walking down the hallway to the room where Boone is. Dr. Pecker lists Boone's psychological problems and hands the doctor a big red folder. A uh, small point here, but since Pecker has shown he is a questionable therapist, he could have really put anything he wants in that folder, right? He seems like exactly the kind of guy to see what he can get away with. He's in the middle of blurting out his patient's psychological profile, saying juvenile delinquency, periodically institutionalized, some violent episodes, no criminal charges, and he's been in my care for the last when he's cut off by chrome thumb screams. And when the screaming starts, the hospital staff charge in to help Chrome Thumbs. Then we see Thumbs peeling off his scalp. He did say he was going to reveal his true face, didn't he? He's holding chunks of hair and flesh up to Boone who's staggering backwards towards the door as a doctor and the ER nurse rush in. She asks what he's done, to which Boone answers, Nothing. Another lie, since he's the one who provoked Narcissus, who ends up peeling off the skin, covering most of his own scalp, and all the way down around his neck, leaving him with his face, his ears, and a tuft of hair in the back like a ponytail. Is this the first instance of transformation in Nightbreed? It's shades of Tusk surgical transformation. I hadn't even thought of that, but... Just because the surgery is performed by a rank amateur with a pair of Cracker Jack toys. Although, he really doesn't transform into anything. Also true. Even though he's supposedly gained a supernatural power or two, he still really looks like a thrift store groupie, just after having survived a thorough scalping. So, no transformation yet. Mm, nope. If he had lost his face too... Maybe. He even teases us by saying that he has a face under his face, but he keeps the top face. I guess that's why he's named after Narcissus, since he couldn't bear to peel off the prettiest parts. At least, that's what lets him emote through the prosthesis, which is good, since the actor is quite an expressive mugger playing a lovable maniac. They're fun to watch emote. Anyway, the staff chases Thumbs into bed. Bacon Angel staggers out of the room and says, That nut needs help! funneling personnel past him. When the hall is clear, Boone sees Dr. Pecker at the end of it, staring him down. He stares back for a bit, then bolts as the doctor starts to walk towards him. That gives Bacon Angel an easy escape. Fast forward to Dr. Pecker waiting in the hall as Inspector Token and the ER doctor exit Thumbs' room, saying he's not making a lot of sense. Something about a place called Midian. They also say he's dying and probably wants that. Really? Is that his prognosis? This doctor really earned his doctoring degree and doctoring good. Dr. Decker says to Token, I know Boone, how he talks and how he manipulates, suggesting he might be able to get something out of Chrome Thumbs. Token, an authority figure in this situation, does the all-too-lenient judge thing and just lets Decker interrogate the dying man by himself. Decker then takes the time to interrogate Chrome Thumbs for reasons? He wants to know more about Midian. Clearly, he's interested in the origins of the Midian myth. If he can get enough sources, he can write a study of this unexplored urban legend. Maybe make a movie, become a specialist for those afflicted with Midianoia. Oh, I get it. It's some kind of like tenure thing for shrinks. Suddenly, we're watching Boone on his long drive into the woods. We see him fleeing Calgary in a pickup truck, speeding towards Dwyer as the camera soars high above in the same, You're in the wilderness now, boy, 
establishing shot you get from every movie. Steering like he's having a Mario Kart flashbacks, Bacon Angel follows the instructions of Chrome Thumbs to what looks like a painting of a gated cemetery surrounded by a concrete wall and dense scrub. Look, my liege! Midian. Midian? Midian? It's only a model. Since there are no cemeteries out there that look this cool, weird, and arcane, they used a painting to portray Midian. He arrives while there is still some light in the sky and parks in the tall grass, leaving his blue truck just outside the mandatorily creaky gate, which looks like the one in his dreams, if overgrown and, well, rusty. The ironwork of the gate is fashioned into a crucified letter M, and there are twin pillars on either side. One is broken, but the other is topped with a partially peeled metal pomegranate. Pushing past the gate, he goes inside past normal cemetery statuary, then definitely not normal masonry, like monkey heads and imp orgies. Makes me want to play Corruption of Champions. <laughs> me too. The sun starts setting, so he finds a nice column to sleep against. Good to know he wandered all this way into the unused set of labyrinths just to take a power nap? As he's wandering about, you can count the pollen in the air. I barely have any allergies, but those hovering motes of tree sex are making my eyes water just picturing it. Have you tried Smetadrill? I hear it's powerful stuff. <laughs> Smetadrill? You're kidding. There's a drug called Smetadrill? Yes, and they're sponsoring this podcast. Uh, what? Allergies like ragweed and grave musk turning you into an oozing monster? How did you get in here? How did he get in here? Just read the script. Tired of medications that leave you desiccated like a mummy? Or so drowsy you're sleeping like the dead in the middle of your day? Who is this guy? All that time wasted cutting yourself to remember how to feel? Wait, what? They paid for this space. Well, suffer no more because Smenadryl is the magician-made miracle cure. I don't like this. One lick of our luscious lozenges, and you'll know you found the holistic, homeopathic miracle cure for every known allergy. Give the money back right now. I spent it already on lube. It even works on at least 79% of unknown allergies. That's a whopping 179% of guaranteed relief. There better be some damn good lube. Smetadrill will relieve your itchy eyes, congestion, eczema, chakras, anal leakage, and vertigo in no time. I'm pretty sure my own symptoms are purely psychosomatic. <laughs> what the hell? That's what happens when you go off script. Real professional craft day. Don't bother to ask your doctor if Smenadryl's right for you. It is. That's the worst thing to say. Fill every hole in your life with Smetadryl. <sighs> Side effects include moderate smoldering, hallucinations, tooth filing, cannibalistic impulses, brown stuff, lucid dreams, walking without rhythm, and a rare form of sensitivity to sunlight that may lead to spontaneous combustion. Your life is waiting for you with a modicum of anal leakage. Are we done now? Yes. Why say it'll cure anal leakage if it's also a cause? It stops the leak unless you've been taking it for a while. Then it comes back. With a vengeance. Whoosh! All over the walls! It's like a fire hose full of stew. <gasps> Smetadrill. A fire hose full of stew in every lozenge. You'll get a commission for that one. Please go away. Fine. And you're no longer in charge of advertising. That's cool. I got what I wanted anyhow. And we're back, watching time pass, until it's midnight in the garden of boon and evil, thanks to the magic of time-lapse photography. Night descends upon the ivy-clad mausoleums, next door to a secret underground fog machine factory, I guess. Pan to one of the factory's exhaust vents, which hisses out some excess fog. Or it may just be one of the monstrous denizens of Midian. I'd also like to point out that the grate has a Star of David at the center, so... So here's another clue to consider with regards to our pet theory, that the residents of Midian are at least a little Jewish. That puff of smoke comes up from the grate and materializes as a small dog on his chest, licking him? <gasps> Ooh, wait! I know! It's a vampire dog, and it's working its way to his throat! Oh. Bacon Angel wakes up and startles the little dog that runs away, sounding like a... That. 
Vamp dog confirmed. He scampers off into the waiting arms of his minion, a pale guy with a necklace made of dried bird's heads, and a little German flag hanging from his right nipple piercing. Naturally. Here's another character they don't name till much later. He's Onaka, and the actor's name is Simon Bamford. And aside from the fantastic tats, he's the most normal-looking nightbreed in the whole film. Onaka and his master, the vamp dog, keep to the shadows and watch the scene play out. Boone hears a roar, a growl, and staggers around, scared, until he's accosted by someone with a curved blade and severe lionitis, to the point that his head is shaped like a crescent moon, his chin and forehead forming the points. Yeah, he gets jumped by Mac tonight, who holds a knife to his throat instead of singing him a jingle. <laughs> oh my god, that's who this guy reminded me of. I miss those McDonald commercials. We don't find out until later, but his name is Kinski, and he's played by Nicholas Vince. When he talks, his voice seems to echo like there are two voices speaking in unison. Maybe it's the shape of his sinuses and jaw causing the effect. Opposite him is a man whose face is half Ferengi and covered with slender predator tentacles. A predator, if you will. I will not. To me, he's Benedict Cumberbatch spliced with a Japanese fighting fish. The character goes by Pelican. Isn't that one of those birds with a saddlebag for a beak? That's a pelican. That's a kind of Asian armadillo, right? That's a pangolin. I thought that was the chair that Infra's Nympho was carried around in from History of the World Part 1. Please, step on the same foot at the same time! My tits are falling off! That's a palanquin. I'm calling him Fredator. But his buddy, Mac tonight, wants to bring Boone down below. But Pell says he's not Nightbreed. He's natural. Which I thought was commentary on how tight Boone's jeans are. On how natural and edible he is? Hey, hear that, earthy, crunchy, organic, anti-GMO cowards? You're just making yourself more palatable. More the fact you can see he's not circumcised through the denim. Oh! As Bacon Angel tells him, yes, he does belong, and that he's bad. He's killed 15 people. Where did he get that number from? The doctor said six families. He only had looked at four photos. Predator, though, apparently has the power to smell innocence. Is that more like mulberry or orange spice? It's more like vanilla. Predator tells him that he was lied to about killing people. Mactonite says that if they eat him, they break the law. Boone asks if that's true. Pell says, everything's true. God's an astronaut, Oz is over the rainbow, and Midian's where the monsters live. And you came to die. And he may as well have added, cannibalism is kosher, to that list. He then takes his jacket off with electric blue flickering in his eyes. This is the first bit of actual transformation. Pell thrashes his nutty dreadicles, which look more like coral snakes now. Like a porn star librarian letting her hair down in the process is getting tentacle erections and amazing low bridges just screaming for unbox. Going forward, I will be referring to any transformation that has flinging your head back and forth as going librarian. <laughs> he exhales smoke as if he'd just taken a big hit, revealing brighter fighting fish coloration and sharpened teeth, a much broader nose, whimsically swirling cheek scars. Also, he drools viscous brown stuff now because he's so hungry for man meat. Huh. One love bite to the shoulder later, Bacon Angel finally realizes that things are going badly. And after being wounded, he is now stronger than before and can fight free. That's not something that happens when you're hurt. He socks Fredator in the face and elbows Mac tonight. While he's running, we are given an underground scene of Toadie from the Gummy Bears drumming for reasons. Don't worry, Dukums. We'll get those Gummy Bears yet. Would you like me to drum some more, Dookie? It always soothes you. <laughs> Pell gives chase and we can now see he's wearing a pirate shirt. Very jaunty. He's one of the infamous Arlong Fishman pirates from One Piece. Predator cannot seem to find him. They draw out the chase long enough for Mac to catch up to Pelican, trying to convince him not to pursue. But Pell says, he's meat, he's meat. Which makes me think of Terry Besson's short story, Meat. If only Pell kept going with, we probed them, they're meat all the way through. Check the show notes for the story and short film. You'll be glad you did. There's more running. 
Pell rakes his claws across a pillar, trailing sparks. Because that always helps. Boone stops to hyperventilate into his open wound, peeling back his leather jacket to get a good look at the bite. Sanitary? <gasps> yeah, really sanitary. The quality of the Wuchi here is fantastic. The skin down the center of the wound where Pell's teeth bunched it together makes it look like the man-hungry dreadhead stopped shy of sinking in too deeply or tearing off anything. It even pulses and writhes. You can just barely hear a disembodied voice saying, Hear me. Save me. Kind of like the wound is talking to him. I assume the disembodied voice is Baphomet, who we'll meet later. A real pillar of the community, that guy. Literally. Boone and the camera spin dizzily for a bit. Then Mac catches up, grabs him by the collar, and tells him which way to go to escape. The gate's that way. Run while you still have legs. Maybe Mac knows Pell is a leg man and will start there once he catches up. Predator still wants his man meat and breaks free, stopping just short of the gate that Bacon Angel had recently run through, sniffing the air, backing into the cemetery again while complaining about something natural. Really? What a weird term to use here. You are surrounded by a field of tall grass, and now you are worried about nature. Boone slowly wanders through the reeds into the dark, even more afraid of what scared the monsters off. He had parked just a few yards outside the gate and is staring nervously. Suddenly, he has a random encounter that spawns four cop cars that turn on their high beams. That is the only way I can justify him not seeing four cars sitting by his own. When the headlights flash on, Inspector Token says he's under arrest. Decker then approaches Bacon Angel, telling him that the police know everything, and he needs to give up. Wait, is that how this works? A non-police doctor can just walk up to a possible serial killer? Bacon Angel petulantly says he didn't do it to the man that he was just informed had lied to him about having killed several people, and told him to take responsibility for it. The doctor shouts, he's got a gun, before diving out of the way. And our hero has his white tee and leather jacket ruined for life. Boone gets filled with lead. Um, how often do cops bring semi-automatic weapons in Canada? Later we see the armory for a sheer neck, and it makes me wonder, since none of the actors have a Canadian accent, are we supposed to think this is in the U.S.? I mean, we are porked in the head about guns, and think that if you can't shoot a solution into your problem, then you just need bigger and faster bullets. I thought the majority of First World nations were better than that. Detective Token McGruff approaches Bacon Angel while he is lying on the ground like a dead beetle, and asks Decker about the gun. The one Boone clearly does not have, who plays it off with... He was reaching in his jacket. And I'm thinking this is why you would not want a non-police person involved in a possible serial killer interrogation during an arrest. There will be repercussions for this, right? Nope. Dramatic bird's eye zoom out from Boone's corpse. Can cops just go unannounced to another's turf and shoot the fuck out of their targets? Why not? Lori's name is mentioned for the first time as we cut to the police station. Cabbage Patch is wearing her finest knitted granny sweater. Finally, she gets a name after 25 minutes into the film. Ms. Winston. She is asked to ID the body and nods quietly before going off to be interviewed by Decker and McGruff, the crime dog, as the mortician is wheeling Bacon Angel away for an autopsy. Decker and Cabbage Patch exchange pleasantries, both saying that he spoke a lot about the other. Token offers to let her do this later, but she wants to get it done now. He asks about her relationship with Bacon Angel, and she confirms that they were lovers. Enough talk! Autopsy time! The mortician looks a bit like a malnourished Colonel Sanders had a love child with Mark Hamill. This is Peter Marinker, a prolific actor who's been in all sorts of stuff, including Event Horizon, Judge Dredd, and the Dark Souls games, to name a few. And he's using what looks like a dental hook to poke at the bite on Bacon Angel's shoulder. He's listing off locations of Boone's bullet wounds to his assistant, a black orderly who holds up the holy leather jacket and comments, Jesus, they were not taking any chances. Mm. And in my mind, that sentence continued, You would have thought he wasn't right. Over in the interview room, Cabbage Patch is insisting that Bacon Angel would not have hurt anyone, to which our good doctor states flatly, Everybody has a secret face. The lack of subtlety would make this foreshadowing only for everyone not already creeped out by the shrink. Cabbage Patch finds out where Boone snuffed it. Back to the autopsy. Coffee break. This was a much-needed scene. Do not diss 
coffee. It is a medical miracle that has saved the lives of millions. Imagine how many would have been killed on most mornings if no one had coffee. If you hadn't had coffee. Yeah, okay, good point. Back in the autopsy room, Bacon Angel is alone on the table, his bite becoming electrically charged and pulsating as if it is fed up with this crap and wants to go out on its own. That's sometimes how my own cramps feel. Now you know why medical marijuana is a thing. It is giving him a dream of running through the tall grass in Midian as the camera pans along his naked body, making tiny twitches that remind me of my dog when she is passed out on the love seat. Next, we see the medical pan hit the floor, spilling out tools and what looks like seven bullets. The orderly was right. They were not taking any chances. We're back to the interrogation room again, and apparently the room is actually in the hospital and not the police station. And they heard the pan fall, so everybody piled out to go see what was going on. We get a broken window with a blue sky and fluffy clouds, and I'm just picturing a nude bacon angel sprinting down the road with things flopping around in fascinating ways. <laughs> Back in the autopsy room, the mortician and his assistant come in with coffee cups and token the crime dog. The mortician states that somebody took the body and proceeded to pick up the bloody bullets, while the detective charged toward the broken window looking for, I don't know, footprints in the flower bed. We're done with that scene. Now Cabbage Patch is at home as she collects her best granny sweaters in a suitcase while fantasizing of nude Bacon Angel who appears before her in a vision? A waking dream? A hologram? Did did the doctor dope her now as well? You have no romance in your soul. I'm half ginger. I only have a vestigial kind of soul. Like those tiny little pips in banana na 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 She's crying for her lost love. Moving on, we're suddenly looking at the front page of the most generic newspaper ever, the Daily Examiner, which shows Boone's bird's eye body in the brush before the gates of Midian. Decker is listening to a tape of Bacon Angel's therapy session in a room that our set designer had gone nuts in, with tons of prints of the same black and white photo. I'm not sure, but I think it's of a person sitting in a chair with their eyes cut out? Plus, matching floor to near ceiling orange bubble lamps. And the table before him has a newspaper and at least 17 long blades, some machetes, some switchblades. It is really hard to go evil lair when your decor echoes lava lamp. In the recording, we hear that when Bacon Angel is underground in Midian, he is dead, but still functional and will live forever. This pisses off the doctor, who now hucks the tape player at the wall. But the tape player is just as immortal as Boone, continuing to play while lying broken on the floor. And apparently fuck that scene, because now Cabbage Patch is driving, while impersonating Scully from the X-Files. It's night now, and she slinks into the Buffalo Days Rodeo bar, asking for a draft and directions to Midian. Remember, this is Canada! But there are no less than four patrons wearing baseball caps with longhorns attached, visible while she's talking to the bartender. The bartender mentions that several reporters have been asking about the place since the baby slasher was bagged up there. We are now told that it was 30 shots to bring him down. Also, baby slasher sounds like a description of Chucky. I know that stories blow up with the retelling, but seriously, seven bullets were pulled out in the morgue, so either this is way out of proportion, or those cops are all cross-eyed and trained with stormtroopers. For some reason, finding out Boone was accused of being a baby slasher doesn't console Lori one bit, so she is crying in the bathroom while trying to fix her makeup. In walks a lady I really could not describe because I was way too distracted by her wind chime sized earrings. Every time she moved, I kept expecting to hear a clang of a boy. She made some light comments about men or money problems that got Cabbage Patch to laugh. He didn't come back, did he? Oh, that's even worse. Nah, undead joke. I definitely got the vibe that Cabbage Patch had made a decision and was picking up wind chimes for a rebound. You're not the only one who thought that. I still think of Lori as a swinger since she was sharing Boone with Decker, but no lesbian interludes for us. At least not on camera. Let me have my dreams. 
Back at the bar, Cabbage Patch and Wind Chimes decide that tomorrow they will go to Midian so Cabbage Patch can have closure. She then leaves to get a room for the night. My mind was wandering here about her popped collar, and I think that fashion choice peaked at, well, it doesn't look too stupid. Wind Chimes opts to try her luck with the people still in the bar, which instantly pays off with a drink from a gentleman by the door, who she calls the picture of sophistication. Meanwhile, we descend into Midian for Boone's initiation. So, that would make the bite from Fredder his hazing? I'm gonna say yes. We are now heading into the Draugr rest home with Chrome Thumbs and Bacon Angel. I like Draugr rest home. Chrome Thumbs looks like a demented hunter who decided to make a trapper hat trophy from his own scalp. It would seem that Bacon Angel remembered to grab his jacket and pants from the morgue, much to my disappointment. I guess the now not-so-white tea was too trashed to grab. They emerge from a tunnel talking about the upcoming meet and greet as if they'd been there for years. Chrome Thumb seems to be completely over Bacon Angel lying to him to get the directions to Midian and is now his best buddy. This is proven with the male bonding moment when Bacon Angel responds to a playful punch to his shoulder by saying he will rip Chrome Thumb's face off if he does it again. After being being let in by Mac tonight, we have a pot of light soup at a rolling boil, surrounded by several entities, some of which we have seen before. Fredder, who seems completely cool with the entire thing, Porcupine Lady, a rejected concept art of Two-Face, Conspiracy Gypsy, she's a hazelnut brown lady that has tinfoil wrapped dreads, uh, Skin Tags, who has hands all down his neck, the Vamp Dog and his minion, an elderly ragman, uh, the elderly ragman with red eyes was introduced as Wilesburg? Dirk Lylesburg, as played by Doug Bradley, the guy who played Pinhead in Hellraiser. Seriously, you just made up all of those names. I don't know. They were whispering, and it looks like he has oozing gills on his face. I'll refer to him as Fish. We also have the porcupine lady who now gets a name, Shana Sassy. Sassy! As played by Christine McCorkendale. Since Bacon Angel asked and mentioned that he had dreamed of her, amazingly she informs Fredder that she had dreamed of Bacon Angel. And do we ever get any reason for this? No, just move along. Maybe it's Baphomet. Fish steps forward for a rather pretentious ceremony involving the light soup, which is apparently actually blood? The blood of Baphomet, an entity that was once purportedly worshipped by the Knights Templar. This ceremony requires Bacon Angel to forsake the natural world. During this process, Chrome Thumbs is trying to light a smoke, and, for comic effect, he strikes a match on the stone wall so everyone can stare at him. After the awkward silence, Fish... er... Lylesburg puts his hand in the soup and then places it on Bacon Angel's chest between the bullet holes so he can be judged. The imprint glows for a moment and now the bullet holes are gone. Hey! He is now declared part of the Tribes of the Moon. End with a shot of Midian by night. In the morning, though, wind chimes... Whose name is Cheryl Ann, played by Deborah Weston. Meets with Cabbage Patch and gets her hangover helper, which is apparently two eggs in a glass with bourbon? Ugh. Her new beau is called Curtis. He's a divorced banker, just moved to Edmonton, and roofied her up but good the night before. Now that's out of the way, the ladies leave for Midian and split up when they get there. Classic horror movie mistake. They marvel for a moment at what a pit the cemetery is, and Cabbage Patch opts to look around while Wind Chimes implies she will stay at the car. I'm thinking Wind Chimes wants to stay behind and flick her bean. She goes so far as to set the radio, gets comfy, and lights some scented candles. <laughs> this session is going to be intense. Lori walks through the grass and pushes past the creaky gates, wandering amidst the tombs. She's wearing a natty old sweater and a silk scarf, which I'm sure is to cover up the choking marks. She's also got a butterfly brooch and a splash of color, although it looks a bit like somebody got it out of a gumball machine. Wind Chimes prepares to go to her happy place. She smiles when she sees her new man, Curtis. But the man coming her way is Decker. He has time to say hello before we jump back to Lori. Cabbage Patch is wandering through arches and bizarre statuary and hears a sad, chittering sound. It's Gollum's hairy little sister, lying naked on a slab, feebly twitching. She is hairless Rex, kind of cute. As Couch Patch gets closer, Conspiracy Gypsy calls to her, asking that she bring the twitching creature to her. 
Once inside the shade of the tomb, we hear wet, grisly noises. In Conspiracy Gypsy's arms, the creature shifts through a variety of different shapes, from gray to an eye-eye, and finally settling on a little girl. She really does look like a gray at one point. This is the second on-screen transformation in the film. It takes what looks like some puppetry, some prosthesis, and a few quick edits as they swap in Little Orphan Annie. Rachel the Gypsy tried to explain to Cabbage Patch that Babette likes to play outside, but just doesn't understand that the sunlight will hurt her. She is a ginger after all. When she sets Babette down, she's a five-year-old pale Irish girl with crazy curls all over the place. Conspiracy, on the other hand, is dark-skinned, and the kid is on this side of clear. I have to think she was adopted, and if so, good on them. This is making Monsters of Midian more humanistic than many of the naturals. Lylesburg shows up with Vamp Dog and his minion to chastise Rachel. Conspiracy, Gypsy. For telling the natural too much. They go back and forth on what is owed for saving the child's life, and Lyle offers the kid to Lori as payment. She pauses for a moment, I presume, to consider the walkie situation, and then declines, asking for information instead on Bacon Angel. Fish warns he cannot give information, or would have dire consequences to his people. She insists, but the Nightbreed just silently walk away, down the stairs to the heart of Midian. Cabbage Patch tries to follow, but the stairs are strewn with snakes, like living speed bumps. As she nears the bottom, a juggalo jumps out and grabs her, but is immediately thrown off by Fredditor, who is claiming her as his. She screams and runs back up the stairs once again, and he calls after her, Y'all don't come back now, you hear? Lori speed walks away through the field of tall grass to the car where she sees the jacket that Wind Chimes was wearing, her purse, and on the window of the open passenger side door, there's a big blood spatter. Lori slows down when she notices the blood and starts looking around. We get a look at the whimsically swampy and overgrown forest around Midian, and it looks like something out of the dark crystal. Please? Please? Wait! Please make peace! Calling for her friend, she finds wind chimes pinned to a tree by a variety of knives. She's flayed open, and blood is everywhere. Frankly, this is not subtle. Yet, Cabbage Patch only just noticed when she was nearly on top of her former friend, and is slowly walking towards her. After seeing this, she looks around the tall grass. Movie music changes tempo as we hear the shring of a blade. A blade that's longer than her torso is wide. Apparently, just to her right was Mr. Gosh. Look, the man is wearing all black. He has a sack over his head. He is not short. There is no tree coverage. How did she not see him? He greets her by name, and I will give her credit. She actually asked how he knew her name. He puts his finger in the open zipper mouth of the mask as if in contemplation and says, that's a good question. Reaching through the zipper and pulling up the mask, showing his Dr. Decker and says, here's your answer. (gasps) Dr. Pecker is Mr. Gosh? I mean, Dr. Gosh. I shall refer to him as Dr. Gosh going forward. He then starts to explain that he knows Bacon Angel is alive and has decided that if he can kill her, then Bacon Angel would be drawn out. For some reason, he feels this is a good time for the mask to go back on. And her solution is to run back into the cemetery. And goes through many of the horror movie, the maiden in distress tropes. Loudly whining, falling over nothing, gets up, falls again, runs into miscellaneous nothings again. He falls behind slowly, Jason style. And even though he seems to be shuffling, he keeps up with her and swings wildly with his blade. In his defense, he did say he was specifically trying to use her as bait to lure Bacon Angel out from wherever he's hiding, so her panicked run and sexy time noises would be effective. Those sexy time noises go quite well with the drumming we hear from below. The camera keeps cutting down to Midian, where Toadie is playing the drums again, and all the other citizens are looking up at the ceiling, listening. The montage of the denizens of Midian listening to the hunt above them includes Smoosh Face and Alien Autopsy Baby. We also get to see Bacon Angel being held by two Midian residents, one in each arm as he's declaring, He's not gonna let Cabbage Patch die! Fish Face chides him by saying that he made an oath and needs to honor it and leave his old life behind. Cut back to Topside. She's playing peekaboo with the headstones, making more of those noises. And when the weasel pops out, 
She runs away like a three-year-old and falls over. Dr. Gosh steps on her ankle as she tries to crawl away. At this point, all she's missing here is a see-through nighty and a candlestick for the horror tropes to be complete. Below, Boone declares his love for her, and Lylesburg tries to explain that she's a natural. There's no way she can love him. He doesn't care, and starts punching people. I was cringing because of the close quarters combat around what looks like a diorama of their founding members, right down to the obsidian statue of Baphomet in the center. And naturally, topside again, with Dr. Gosh, he tries to convince her to lay still, and that it's easier that way as he looms over her and then backhands her in the face. This is the point when Bacon Angel opens up the crypt door and steps out. They have a conversation, questioning whether they are alive or dead. Dr. Gosh says they're both alive. Our hero says they're both dead. Cabbage Patch, dazed and laying there on the slab, weakly calls out Bacon Angel's name. Dr. Gosh pulls out what looks like a switchblade and ruins our rescuer's white shirt by stabbing him in the middle of the chest. He goes through them so quickly. Boone is clearly not a vampire as he's up and transformed in the daylight. At least he didn't sparkle. He doesn't seem phased by being stabbed. How effective really was all that punching he was taking down below anyway? He declares that blades are no better than bullets. Then he grabs Dr. Gosh and takes his mask off. While he's doing this, Chrome Thumbs arrives with a straw hat for some reason and then makes a bid for the doctor's balls and eyes. Unless, of course, the hero wants them. Chromosomes, a fucking spell check, monologues at the doctor about how he took advantage of him. While he was weak and dying and it's payback time, then for some reason we hear crows and the doctor's now able to run away? The birds are in cahoots with the pigeons. It's that simple. Bacon Angel now turns to brace himself on the headstone, trembling a little as he transforms just a bit. This is another dankification. We just get a puff of smoke and some tribal scarification. Where are the claws, the tentacles, fangs, additional limbs, weaponized unibrow? We get any of them? No. We get a white boy pretending to be tribal with some false fangs and fancy contacts. Dankification is possibly the most boring kind of transformation we've seen yet. That's right. Boone is the second vaporware we've come across. Okay. Vaporware almost makes it worth it. Boone goes charging off after the doctor, but then comes back after Chrome Thumbs decides to cuddle up to Cabbage Patch as she's still laying on the ground. Thumbs is now straddling her, so naturally she starts to scream. When our hero returns, we get a slightly better look at his markings. To be honest, as a supernatural perk, I'm not impressed. Chrome Thumbs reminds him of his new look and that his lady is not going to like it. So he inhales light and smoke? Hey, is this movie anti-smoking? For Boone, the transformation seemed to revolve around taking a big puff. For his reversion back to his casual walking around form, Clive Barker opted to play the exhaled vape hit in reverse, with sparklies added in order to suck the scarification off his face. Back to what passes for normal, he picks her up. Back below... Fishface is pissed off about them now for being reckless and putting all of Midian in danger for Boone's love of this woman. Bacon Angel assures him that Dr. Gosh won't tell anyone, but is countered that he could still lead their enemies to them. Our hero says he will make amends, but Lylesburg isn't hearing it and tells him to take the girl and go. Very much like God telling Adam and Eve to get the fuck out of Eden their law, and that Baphomet came up with it. So Boone goes over Lyle's head and takes his petition straight to the literal pillar of the community. With another look at that little obsidian statue, I notice its right hand is giving a thumbs up like the fawns. I'm still not entirely clear if the big one below is still a living nightbreed, or if he's genuinely a statue. If it's a living entity, then they have some form of leprosy that is turning its body into a bioluminescent fungus. Boone then comes in stage right and faces Baphomet. As the statue's eyes open, glowing green, we see he is still alive and clearly having a bad millennia. I guess that's why Bacon Angel didn't bother to tell him off. And without warning, we're suddenly now with a close-up of a frumpy veteran hunkered down behind a taxidermied, uh, coyote? Dog? Critter? Uh, The old guy puts me in the mind of the grandfather from the Lost Boys that seems to be running, in the loosest of terms, a gas station that is out of gas. 
It almost seems like he's a squatter. The actor is John Egger, by the way, who was briefly married to Shirley Temple in the 40s. She was in her 40s? Eh, not quite a silver fox, but still a cougar, right? The 40s. The. Now, I need a moment to talk about this guy. He seems to be wearing a camouflage baseball cap with assorted toys attached to it. A Barbie cowboy boot. A random fork and key. The husk of a matchbox car. What looks like the plastic chameleon that was cut in half and stuck to either side of the head like it's just passing through. There's also what seems to be a Barbie doll wearing an electrical tape bikini, and she has a starfish, not chocolate, on or instead of her face. We then get a look at his mechanics onesie, and he has more miscellaneous crap attached. I believe there was, like, six keys, and there's more plastic lizards cut in half? Also, it looks very much like some kind of three-fingered alien hand is trying to jut from just under his sternum. Shades of the chestbursters from aliens. Do they ever give him a name? Nope. Fine. Oh, gasless gas man, I christen thee Bino. Huh. All right. Bino is petting the formerly animate dog thing, reassuring it about their newest customer. In walks Dr. Gosh, to use the old man's phone. So this place is what? A boarded up, non-gas station? Dog kennel? Taxidermy? A kid shop? The old man allows Dr. Gosh to use his landline. I wonder if that trope will ever stop being relevant. Bino tells him he's not sure if the phone actually works. Oh, that was helpful. Well... Dr. Gosh is making the call. The old man stresses that he won't be able to get anybody out here. He pauses briefly and sniffs the air, asking Dr. Gosh if he had been up to Midian. Says he smelled like he had, and then gives a dopey little laugh. The doctor pauses, clearly sizing up his next victim. On the phone, he convinces Inspector Token to bring the authorities to Midian. Is this in his jurisdiction? We'll soon see how Token takes a backseat to the local authorities, so probably not it was because he was black and outnumbered. Is that a terrible thing to say? Nope. You're just being a critic and pointing out that Token is one of those characters that lives and dies by many of the movie tropes about black people. It's my mutant superpower to be a flaming douchebag. I'm really trying to use it for goodish. Bino insists Midian is not a town at all, but simply the cemetery, and tells him the nearest police are in Sheerneck. He arranges to meet the investigator there and then starts questioning the old man as to whom is buried in Midian to appreciate the very blunt dead folk and prospectors that came from all round everywhere that were buried up there. The doctor asks, what else? The old man reiterates, ain't nothing but dead folk. The doctor thanks him and walks out of the front door. And to his credit, the old man immediately locks it behind him. Then starts walking around his place, growling a little and saying, it had to happen sometime. They couldn't hide forever up at Midian. He pauses to pet his stiff hairy thing. Bonk wow Ugh. While staring off into space, he hears his dogs outside barking. Looking about, he notices the back door is open. Whoop! Just like that plump suburban family. And it was around 19 seconds between seeing the back door was open and locking the front. So that means Dr. Gosh went immediately from the front door to his car, got his gimp mask and a gigantic machete. Then ran around the building and slipped in the back. And this backdoor man can do all of that in less than 19 seconds. The doctor is in incredible health. I can just picture him legging it around the building, doing some acrobatics over the dogs, and panting like a Darth Vader cosplayer in the noonday sun as he slinks into the hovel. I am way too distracted with how many knockoff Barbie dolls he's got hanging by their ankles from the ceiling, as if they were so many bunches of drying herbs. As he's consoling his beloved post-mortem Pomeranian, the doctor comes from behind a cabinet and chops its taxidermied head off before manhandling Bino. We leave Bino with Dr. Gosh for a bit, however, to find Cabbage Patch is waking up from a fitful sleep to a kitten crying. Looking around the room, we see it's lined with skulls of assorted, say, humanoid species? And a mosaic that would have made Metallica proud. As she sits up, we find out that her bed was a nice coffin that was set upon a pair of cheaper coffins to raise it off the dirt floor. It's very considerate. She notices Conspiracy Gypsy hanging out in the corner of the room in her gauzy gray robe. Which, incidentally, makes a lovely camouflage for this room only. And at first, you're really only seeing just her face and hair against the backdrop of skulls. Her entire wardrobe was just for this moment. 
Cabbage Patch gets out of the coffin as gracefully as she can. At best, she managed not to faceplant. And then starts asking questions, clarifying that she did indeed see Bacon Angel, even though he is most definitely well and truly dead. He's really most sincerely dead. Rachel is also holding closely to the little red-haired girl Lori saved from the sun, and we find out the little ginger wear gerbil's name is Babette. Apparently, this character was played by two twin girls, Nina and Kim Robertson. Rachel tells Lori that she is now below with the Nightbreed, who happen to be the, quote, last survivors of the great tribes, unquote. Does that mean they're all Jewish? Is this movie pro or anti-Semitic? The tribes of the moon are nearly all of an original physique? I don't like body shaming unless the person has a personality to match. Or it's really funny. (laughs) Or merely playfully deformed, like the guy with a blowfish for a face. But even then, implying an entire tribe of Jews are hideous monsters seems pretty anti-Semitic. But some of them are also mostly immortal, or can impart immortality. Okay, maybe not so anti-Semitic after all. Also, that would be a hell of an elevator pitch for any religion. Never die of old age. Uh, expect deformity. Knows for too much to do in so little time? Nip the tip and give death the slip. Either way, I'm not sure if we're qualified to make that critique, as we're the ones who keep calling Rachel Conspiracy Gypsy. As opposed to what? Alternative facts, Romani? If anyone pushes back, we'll just say that some of our best friends are Romani. And we know there are proud and hard-working people that deserves everyone's respect. You're no longer in charge of our social media, either. What up, my gypsy? Wanna lay the hex on some gacho? Maybe throw some tarot? Okay, you're also banned from Twitter. Rachel explains that they are shapeshifters, or freaks, that have been nearly wiped out by Lori's own tribe. The Gentiles? Must have been the Crusades, or Nazis, or something. Also, here, it speaks volumes about humanity, that Lori's first most burning question is, So you're not immortal? Ugh. <sighs> We always seem obsessed on how to kill everything. Yeah, but even still, Rachel is oddly willing to indulge in Lori's desire to know how to murder the breed. She says that some can be killed in sunlight, others can be shot, and others can survive even that because they've already gone beyond death. Bacon Angel is in that category, straight up undead. Okay, so wait, the night breed are a separate evolutionary branch, just like the Neanderthals, hobbits, and David Icke's lizard people. Let's say sure. And they're a separate branch that might have avoided being on the verge of extinction if they'd been allowed to thrive alongside our own version of humanity, who are not only interbreeding with us, Bacon Angel's own family line has them in it. But nobody in his family thought to mention that he could test positive for cryptid? It's like testing positive for Jedi. Although they're not mentioned, Boone's parents did a poor job of preparing him for this inevitable supernatural maturity. Conspiracy Gypsy speaks of being able to fly, and other attributes that many of the Nightbreed people have, and how most naturals dream about being able to do what they do. She says to be able to fly, to be smoke, or a wolf, to know the night and live in it forever, that would not be so bad, but you call us monsters. Point blank, she states that it's naturals that envy the Nightbreed, and what they envy... Lori finishes the thought and says... We destroy. Seeing Lori gets it, Rachel tells Babette to show her. Apparently, one of Babette's abilities, other than poofing into the form of a naked mutant guinea pig, is to touch people and give them flashbacks. Visions from history. They get visions, we get flashbacks. As the little girl holds out her hand to Cabbage Patch, she takes it gently and becomes mesmerized and drawn into the eyes of the skulls that form the walls. Some floodlights get turned on behind them, too. It's a cool effect. Oh, no. You've been sucked into a flashback. We get to see a muddy castle somewhere with lots of people having a really bad time. Somebody's wearing what looks like Nazi boots. There are costumes that imply Crusaders or Knights Templar. I think I also saw a Spanish Inquisition. Oh, I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects 
smash the Spanish Inquisition. They even have a few shots of what looks like the Grand Wizard from the KKK reading from a comically oversized Bible. It has to be a Bible. All that white and a giant gold cross on it. I think he was reading to a guy that looks like Jesus, all meditative and serene while in a torturer's chair with a metal cage over his head. There's some obligatory moaning, and it looks like we're working on a pile of mulch that belongs behind a haunted house attraction. It's a heap of random body parts where someone drops off a giant severed head that's on fire and still trying to speak. I guess that's creepy. Uh... It ends with some nondescript soldiers behind a lady that looks to be dressed as a poor man's mime, and she jumps forward with her hands above her head, with token moaning and yelling. I think she was supposed to be giving us the impression she was being thrown into a pit, but it looked more like she was just hopping off the stage of some school play. Uh, Back to the present. Lori is standing there crying. She lets go of Babette and asks Rachel if Boone really is one of the Nightbreed. Rachel confirms it, and to her credit, Cabbage Patch is cool with it. She's still keen on finding her caveman. But Conspiracy Gypsy is insistent that he cannot be helped because he's gone down to the tabernacle with Baphomet, the baptizer who made Midian and called the Nightbreed there. Lori doesn't give a damn that she's forbidden from seeing Baphomet. At this point, I'm not even sure what either lady is thinking Cabbage Patch is trying to accomplish. She has not made any arrangements for anything, so is she planning to follow him? Is she going to move into Boone's casket in Midian? Are they going to be sleeping in ships? That sucks. She'll storm up to Boone and demand to be treated like a cavewoman. Even if he's already taken a night breed wife, she can make it work. Cut back to Beano, slashed and bloodied, tied up with the same tacky Christmas lights that once decorated his shack. I'm okay with using those lights. He should have had the small bulb fairy lights. Those are much more tasteful than those goose egg bulbs. But those goose egg bulbs heat up like you wouldn't believe. Beano pleads for mercy, having already told his captor everything. Dr. Gosh asks if the monsters in Midian can die, and pokes Bino in the knee with his switchblade for emphasis. He reveals that there are different breeds. Some can die by bullets, others fire. He knows that much about them because he wanted to be one. Dr. Gosh shares his own feelings on the matter, saying that he's here to destroy the night breed. Again, this is being delivered in what I imagine is a lithium-addled monotone by David Cronenberg in a button-eyed, slack-mouthed burlap gimp mask. He's... Cleaned up a lot of breeders, families like cesspools, filth, breeding filth, breeding filth. I was born to destroy Boone and the breed together. What is his criteria for cesspools? Neighborhood? Occupation? Skin color? He has very fluid motivations for a slasher. I'm going to say cosplay choices ticked him off this time. Ah, extreme fat shaming. Got it. I I wasn't going there. Okay, I wear spanks and a cup when I'm in costume. Uh, Unless it's appropriate for the character. That Jareth Bowie bulge? The Goblin's King? Knob Goblin? I haven't had to cosplay for Knob Goblin in a long time, but I'll do it for you. There's that professionalism. Bino calls Gosh crazy, who replies with, No, I'm death, plain and simple. He then pokes him in the knee again, demanding he say it. It's not long before he kills him with a knife to the heart and says, "Hmm, Then don't say it. He does seem to blow a little hot and cold. It's not a good trait for a serial killer, but I can appreciate the need to vent your feelings to your patient once you know they're safely tied to a chair. You get serial killer blue balls if you don't confess your deepest desires and darkest crimes before you shank them. I've seen Dexter. I know the score. That violates rule number seven of the evil overlord list. When I've captured my adversary and he says, look, before you kill me, will you at least tell me what this is all about? I'll say... No, and shoot him. On second thought, I'll shoot him and then say no. That's a good policy. And I think it's a good time for a special theatrical intermission instead of an ad, because we love our listeners that much. And since someone kicked our sponsor out because he's picky. It's not picky to want one that won't make me look like a shill for the quackiest of quackery this side of the snake oil sea. Fine, roll the other drama and smoke them if you got them. Who are you talking to? The Teamsters. Bah! Have they been there this whole time? You never turn around. (laughs) 
I will be amazed if they are open for business. I'll be amazed if we haven't gotten tetanus from just looking at it. Well, hello there. Welcome to my place. You kids seem to be a, a frog princess and a pirate cat. Indeed, I am the Dread Pirate Klobutz, and this is Her Highness, the Empress Rana Yaga. With a bad accent. That's fine, though. I've LARPed. What can I do for you, Queen Baba Yaga and Dreadlock Puss in Boots? Do you have any... No gas. Can I get onto the... No Wi-Fi. Oh, well, I guess. There's a landline on the counter. At least we can... But it might not work. Is there anything useful here at all? Not unless you count my Christmas lights, dioramas, or taxidermy. We don't. Well, you can't have my glue gun. I need it. Huh? I want the glue gun now. No, you don't. There's clearly nothing here of value. Well, there's a small fortune in Smeta drill on that display by the door. Hmm, a fortune, you say? And all the vintage Barbie parts you could ever need. Definitely, we don't need that. Oh, you'd be surprised. Ever since I started trading them on eBay to pay my bills, I've heard many a splendiferous tale about the doll parts people will sell their souls for. Why, I recall one feller in Taiwan there ran afoul of a voodoo curse that required he collect over 7,000 plastic left feet. He had already carried about... We're just looking for directions someplace called Midian. Ain't nobody up there but the dead. Please, I beseech you. My kingdom's fate hangs in the balance. Bah, aristocrats. Eh, fine. It's the subterranean complex beneath the nearby cemetery. Twist the third imp head down on the wrought iron orgy statue. Then walk through the gate at the back of the Suggins family mausoleum. That's Suggins with two G's. Mind the stair snakes and the juggalos. Talk to Lysburg. Tell him young asshat sent you. That's their little nickname for me. He'll show you the ropes from there. Wow. Thank you. Are, are you sure? That sounds like pretty sensitive information. It's fine. I like you too. Also, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. This? This is a Barbie doll? Oh, no mere Barbie doll, I assure you. She is a powerful talisman, a ward against the sad, ancient, and hungry pyres, pushed to the darkness at rock bottom in fear. Also, not sure if you've noticed, I glued a dried starfish where her head should be. I did notice that. So it's a talisman with a starfish head. With a starfish head. I notice a pattern in the glitter. You might call this a starfish of David? <laughs> what are you doing with your face? Is that really how you think winking works? Well, we, we sincerely thank you for the directions and the thing, as well as your hospitality. DPC, we're rolling. Bootsy! Bootsy? Oh, I think he already left. Oh, eh. the carriage awaits! Ta! Have fun, true believers! I have no doubt there will be many a wild adventure in our future. Our destinies have yet to be written. I can't... My Empress, your carriage awaits. Hey, nice bling. Consort Worm, how dare you leave me alone in the mass grave of my childhood joy? My lady, it will never happen again. Though, I admit, I got an itch that demanded to be scratched. Oh, not this again. Let's just say there's a small fortune secreted away within our conveyance. Insufferable cur! If there weren't someone walking towards us right now, I'd box your ears! Hmm, she is a stoic chap. Good day to you, sir! Dashing trench coat you've got there. Everybody has a secret face. Families like cesspools. Filth making filth making filth. Simply brimming with charisma. Tries to hide that sparkle under a bland, glassy pattern of rigid grooming rituals. Definitely an upstanding citizen and not a barking mad knife collector with a murder boner. 
You're still so naive. Also, I haven't forgotten that you left me alone to play pirate. You impudent stray. Take the helm, wastrel. Yes, Empress. To the old cemetery, then. Our royal party senses are all a tingle. I thought you'd be more mad that I sneaked some smell drill into that skit. You know, I would have been if it weren't for the amazing dramatic acumen of the actors you hired. Give it up for Daryl and Anna. Am I right? Truly inspirational. I smell an Oscar. Oh, that, that was me. Sorry, I'll, I'll warn you next time. When last we left Clive Barker's Nightbreed, the denizens of Midian were about to get a visit from Boone's frumpy and panicked girlfriend as she descends into the subterranean grotto. Lylesburg tries to talk her into leaving, but Lori persists in trying to find Boone. She pushes aside Onaka, the guy with the vamp dog, then heads through a tunnel, Onaka following quietly behind. Lori creeps through the tunnel and pops out in front of a stop-motion armadillo velociraptor thing devouring a dead rat. Thus begins Lori's march through a cozy little subterranean freak show. She's walking through the dark, and in the background, we see what looks like a large reflective platter? Yep, we're going through the halls of legend. Any moment, she'll be face to face with darkness, or that ugly one-horned mule. It would make sense that darkness was a nightbreed. Sunshine is my destroyer. Tim Curry is my hero. <laughs> Cabbage Patch goes by Toadie drumming on the walls again. First Tim Curry, now Gummy Bears? What an eclectic collection of cameos. She passes the... How do we do this piece of practical effects madness justice? Okay, uh, just imagine Meatloaf dressed as the three-breasted hooker from Total Recall, but the middle breast is his head, and his arms and legs are atrophied stumps. Bitch tits! His name was Robert Paulson. I mean, I, I have no idea who they got to waddle around in this bizarre suit. Moving on. The lair has rope bridges like the Lost Boys. The vampires from Santa Monica? No, the tinkly feral British ones. Ugh. It reminds me of the widow's web from Crawl. Well, to each his own. We get to watch Vanilla Lori in her Christmas sweater react to everything here. That smell. Hey, a parrot. Old blankets. Windows. Let's look in each one. This one shows three diaphanous lasses, and they're twisted in the face golem with fantastic hair. Who want their privacy. Nice, obvious snooping, Beverly Cleary. In a stop-motion scene of a nude catwoman riding a cycloptic saurian mount, a Coonbarasaurus, probably? I love how sure you are about your paleontology chops. I'm just wondering if it goes well with barbecue sauce. <laughs> paleontology chops. Grill it slow. Jurassic Q. There's a reason why they're extinct. That's right. They're delicious. She also sees a boy and girl washing the face of another sloping blob gimp. Bitch tits. Uh, are we sure it's not a different one? Not when there are this many really ugly people. Is it racist if I can't tell man lumps apart? I like the giant that moans at her and then drools. And roars at her. She sees a pale, tubby hipster, Leroy Gom, biting his thumb to feed blood to his pet eels. Tubbs' friend, the blue demon with curling horns, is devil lewd. They'll pop up occasionally. Leroy makes a lazy or fake grab for Lori and says in a child's voice, There goes the neighborhood! Couch Patch then follows a vision of Bacon Angel into a corridor full of meat people. I know that sounds redundant, but hear me out. There's a lady holding a folding fan over her lower half of her face, and when she moves the fan away, she has no skin below her nose. There's also a different pile of drippy meat guy. A voodoo, just chillin', playing solitaire. And some caged cannibals. Then she stumbles into a room with fire and our smarmy Ferengi predator, the Fredator himself. A pal something or other. Peliquin. And his friend. Johnny Pufferfish for head. Who's dressed in a white tee and jeans like Boone. Another scapee from Captain Udon's crew. Arlong's crew. So long as I get to try some fugu. He has kitty eyes and sharp teeth. And there's no way this actor can see a damn thing through his prosthesis. Peliquin takes her butterfly brooch and pins it to the flesh of his own exposed chest. 
pointing out she's still a natural. He even tauntingly asks her if she wants to join the family, nearly biting her on the neck, saying everyone wants to live forever, eventually, as she runs off. Which makes me wonder, since he bit Boon, doesn't he count as Boon's sire? So if he bites her, that's going to make her Boon's sister. So now we're doing an incest circle here? Well, they'd definitely both be sired by the same freak show. Cut to the police station where Decker meets with Token McGruff, says he found Boone alive and killing again in Midian. Enter Captain Igerman, the crankiest and most high-strung little bastard to run a rural police precinct I've ever seen. He doesn't believe there are people living under Midian. <laughs> to be fair, it is a stupid idea, so I'm not going to fault him on that one. Back in Midian, Lori barges in on Narciss, dancing to the Blue Danube waltz with a woman's desiccated corpse, keeping her from proceeding. Narciss drolls, isn't this place great? It's like Shangri-La on dope. Cabbage Patch is grossed out by some of the smell, but still manages to slip by as he warns her about the berserkers chained up in the corridor. Onaka, keeper of the vamp dog, follows her, but not before Narciss stops him to compliment his epic chest tats. Onaka smiles for a moment, and then, remembering himself, ducks wordlessly after Lori. Narciss lingers behind and shrugs. Huh, sailors. We follow Lori into Berserker Row. I've seen this hallway in the Beastmaster. Heh, <laughs> the gangrene mile. Where she does get groped by some beasties. Onaka saves her, coyly, talking for the first time in the film. She asks for him to take her to Boone, and he does, leading her away as the Berserkers chew on each other a bit. Lori sees Boone with Baphomet and tells her not to look at the crumbly, glowy statue. They embrace and stagger away from an underground storm that's a Bruin. But as they're leaving, we get a look at the platform in front of Baphomet's pedestal, which shows another Star of David carved into the stone. I'm telling you, when Conspiracy Gypsy said the Lost Tribe, she meant Jews! What's more, they're in a frickin' tabernacle. I didn't see any pomegranates. Nor did I, but there is a bowl of blood. Light soup on the boil? I think I'll need some more haphazard symbolism before we declare Midian a den of Zionist intrigue. Ooh, there's more to come on the way. Vamp Dog's minion leads them back to the surface and sits patiently at first, only to slam the door shut behind them when she lets the sunlight into their tomb. Cabbage Patch is still trying to get Bacon Angel to leave the Nightbreed and go back to their old life. They don't need you. I'm the only one who needs you. What a stupid twat. What is her plan? Let's pretend the undead angle isn't a factor. Everyone thinks he is a homicidal maniac that killed six families in ten months. Think he can go back to work in the garage? But rather than stop and think, they escape the cemetery and run off through the reeds. To the Sweet Grass Inn. The host at the counter is talking on the phone, smoking a cigarette, and muckling a big sloppy pastry on her other hand. This woman pains me so badly. Not only is she yelling for someone else in the building, literally into the phone she's supposedly talking to someone else on, therefore blowing out the caller's eardrums, she manhandles that Danish? Eclair, maybe? A, a fluffy thing with cream and Shelly, the size of her face, with all the grace and style of a three-year-old. She sets the phone down and drops half of the pastry, clumsily tearing it apart while taking it off the floor and placing chunks on the counter. Really? Pulls it apart. Like, hold it down, rip, rip, puts pieces on the counter. It's trash. It is trash. You should not have to talk to a grown person like this. At this point... She should have just been eating it out of a dog dish. Regardless, I do appreciate how this act is nearly just as visceral as the rest of the mangled wuchi and spurting squibs in this film. I'd go so far as to call it an excellent metaphor for body horror as a phenomena. Under the counter, she sees a pair of feet walk up and hears something get placed on the front counter. When she looks over the counter, the only thing there is a severed head on the registry. When she screams, we get a good look of her equine overbite. Horses. They'll fucking eat you! Yeah, apparently the camera adds 20 pounds to your teeth. <laughs> she backs up through the door into the office, only to be grabbed from behind by Dr. Gosh, who kills her with a knife to the gut. Wait, how did he get behind her? He would have had to walk around the counter as she was kneeling to get by to go through the door. 
I imagine him pole vaulting over the counter in complete silence just before she stood up. Cut to the outside where Dr. Decker is watching the hotel from his car as Boone and Lori drive up in a pickup truck. Did he teleport again? Or had some time passed with no indication as to how long or if we're even on the same day as the beheading? Boone looks shaken when they enter, asks why the hotel is so empty. Lori says they must be at the rodeo. Ah, yes. A town where one of the most noble professions is clown. When a rodeo is the most plausible reason for a hotel clearing out of every living soul, you are right to want to be somewhere else. Somewhere with sushi restaurants and comic book stores. Anywhere the tallest building in town isn't a church. It's either go to the rodeo or watch curling. Toe curling? Boone smells blood, and Pell warned him the beast would come out when that happened. The look on her face is that she's not due for her cycle in a few days, but suddenly is wondering, But am I wearing those white panties? <laughs> Dr. Gosh makes a call to Sheerneck Police from his car phone, which has a cord, and it is the size of the car's battery. Ah, uh, back in the day when a communication device was not a key part of your identity. Lori finishes changing and then peers through a hole in the wall into the next room she only just noticed. But rats always chew a softball-sized hole at eye level that drips blood, don't they? Boone goes into the next room and sees a longhorned hillbilly bloodbath left by Decker, including a still-standing house of cards. Just in time for us to see the SWAT team arrive. Boone transforms reflexively and has his back to Lori to keep his face hidden. She refuses to leave, so he glances at her with his pale, glyph-etched skin and glowing red eyes. It's brief, but there was a transformation here, looking like an oni from Japanese lore. Is that what he's supposed to be? It looks more like he fell asleep on some lace and it left an imprint across his face. The more I look at it, the more it seems like he was attacked by a spirograph. She screams and staggers out. He shuts the door, blowing down the house of cards, symbolism, and drags three fingers in the blood spilled on the card table, then shoves them much farther down his throat than was really necessary. You would think it was his first birthday cake, and he had grabbed a handful of the frosting, smeared all over his face and hands. I've seen little kids, they even get it in their ears. The SWAT team rolls into the building as Lori is making her escape out the one entrance they didn't cover. And steals a car with a bag full of bagels and an open styrofoam cup on the dash? She just hurls them into the back seat. It's a damn travesty. Ooh, maybe the bagels are a clue. They are historically Jewy. Uh, you're reaching. In the inn, Boone shuts himself in the bathroom and catches his carved up face in the mirror inhaling his sticky icky so he can revert back to normal right before the police bust in and take him off to Sheerneck PD. They march Boone right into the clink. Clink? Wasn't he one of Hogan's heroes? Hogan! He gets walked past Drinky Priest, Ashbury, played by Malcolm Smith. Imagine if Buckaroo Bonsai had become a Christian scientist. That's what he looks like. Is this priest an inmate? You realize the wrongdoings they are known for. He's being detained for drunkenness. Boone meets Captain Eigerman face to face, while arm in arm with his soon-to-be dance partners. While the captain tightens his leather gloves, he reminds one of a bad bus driver, the avid control freak chomping on a cigar and spraying his privilege all over the place. They whack Bacon Angel in the back of the legs to bring him down. Captain Eigerman says, You are a freak and a cannibal, and you've come to the wrong town. If it had been the blood of Christ, would it have been okay? That is still cannibalism, right? I'm going to give you something to remember me by as they shut the door and commence to beating him shitless. They pummel Boone with a sap while Ashbury listens from his nearby cell, clenching his fist hard enough to draw blood from the palm of his nails, miming a slow jerk that leaves his hand bloody. Oh, he really needs to ease up on that grip or he will tear those altar boys apart. Goon One lights a post-coitus, I mean post-beating cigar for the captain. They call him a fucking cannibal, and then a creep, before they leave. In the next cell, Ashbury is staring at his bleeding palm moodily. These guys have no originality. I mean, really, creep? What are they, fucking twelve? Token follows the captain into his office as McGruff demands he be given custody of Boone. Captain Igerman remarks that Dr. Decker is still there. 
for some reason. He admits that he had just tenderized Bacon Angel. Decker wants to go to Midian with the captain, but Eigerman is going to a press conference instead. How Trumpian. All about the press and not inconvenient facts. Which actually will come back to bite him. He wants Token to tell Decker he's got Boone under control. Decker almost chides not to trust him because he changes. The captain gives him a flippant, sure he does, and exits with Token. Token tries to convince him while walking through the police station to go back to Midian since there are others there. Maybe monsters, maybe a cult. <laughs> who, who would even take any official of any kind seriously if they actually said, maybe monsters? Nevertheless, he then assigns Gravy Fries and his partner to investigate the graveyard and look for anybody who has three or more eyes. His name is Petine, not Poutine. The posters behind them are also fascinating. In case of fire, react. Remove occupants and close area. Activate alarm. Call 5555 and try to fight fire. And I'm sorry, but if an amateur is reading that poster, they're going to finish that phrase with try to fight fire with fire. Ugh, I'm so offended. As a gamer, I would say you would fight fire with ice, you noob. <laughs> also, where the fuck are they getting 5555? Five. It's 911 for emergency services there, too. We covered that in the last movie! Another poster asks, Can you get AIDS from a drinking fountain? And what a fascinating little moment in media history. This movie was made the year Ryan White passed away, so it's good to know where we were when this was a common enough question to simply need to put it on posters. Too many people want to know if you can get AIDS from a fountain. The hotline exploded from the burden of informing the public. Get me... Der Postermeister General. I want to carry on about that, but I am too distracted by the rows of glory holes all set up at the front desk that I can only guess is for the SVU. <laughs> Those are mail slots. <laughs> Look, there's an envelope in one. Uh, the envelope is so you can make it a deposit for after hours. That's just to tighten up the holes a little bit for the little guys. I'm so glad we switched to flavored stamps. So much more fun to lick. Whew, that was a huge tirade for such a short scene. Which ends with Detective Token McGruff and his trio of red shirts going to Midian to turn over the shantytown someone set up at the old cemetery. Back in the cell, a toothpick-chomping guard lets the doctor in to give Boone a checkup, shoving him back against the wall over the bench beforehand. I'm still confused on how he's so beat up from four normies, but a stab to the chest meant nothing. And the fist fight in the underground to save Cabbage Pat seems more like... A play date. Part of the way through the examination, the doctor panics and throws down his stethoscope to take Boone's pulse by hand. The doctor then tells the guard that Boone has no pulse, that he's dead. I have actually had that happen to me when I tried using one of those blood pressure machines at Walmart. It gave me a zero after running its whole process, so I guess I'm dead also. <laughs> Is that what happens when you have universal health care? <laughs> we need a corpse alarm like a lunk alarm. But it, it zombie groans. <laughs> the doctor leaves, and the guard points his gun at the dead man Boone while backing out slowly. Is he gonna kill him extra dead? Well, I suppose that is what is needed. I mean, also, why is the doctor so pissed? Does he get paid by the number of living patients he attends to? Is he only mostly dead? Call Miracle Max and get some chocolate. Back at the press conference room for Captain Eigerman, a lady reporter with a bad southern accent asks if Boone has made a full confession yet. The captain says, we found traces of human flesh in his system. The reporter follows with cannibalism? And the captain affirms while calling her sweetheart. I bet she wishes she'd followed with, isn't that something found in all humans? Why jump to cannibalism? We never did get an answer if Cabbage Patch was on the rag. Boone was possibly just looking to earn his red wings. Another reporter asks the captain if it's the same Aaron Boone that was shot down in Midian four days ago. Strangely, the captain does not call the male reporter sweetheart. I'll take you seriously, person with a penis. Why are your words so penetrating to my ear? The reporter says the man who was shot was Aaron Boone, just as the cell guard interrupts the conference to tell Captain about Boone's checkup. That was more of a checkup? That's what they call it when you've got no pulse. So there's your confirmation that Boone was genuinely transformed into a walking corpse. He is made of meat. 
The captain charges off past the press to his office, ignoring the reporter's questions and looking like a scared bunny. He then barges into the office where Dr. Decker is sitting at his desk, quietly playing, I'm in charge. What? So they're seriously considering that Boone is dead? Like, for real? I know this is a movie world, but um, wouldn't they run other tests and have him in a hospital for having such a low heartbeat that they could not hear it? Why are they actually entertaining the whole dead thing? I don't know. He asks Dr. Decker how many bullets they pulled out of that geek up in Midian. And the shrink would know why? The captain gets in his face, so Decker's reflection is now visible in the captain's gold fucking tooth. Now, we are whipped away to Token and the boys wandering through Midian by day. There are people down here. I can feel it. This is the level of the police sophistication we shall continue to get through the rest of this movie. They stumble around, clearly being watched. At one point, they kick in the door to a tomb where the vampire terrier's keeper was hiding. They burst in and rip off his necklace before putting him in a headlock. How rude. And then they rip out his right nipple piercing, which was entirely douchey and cruel. Completely fucking unnecessary. They then drag him out into the sun and surround him with their guns to his head. As he weeps, his body starts to smoke. And Token is the only smart one here, telling them to give him some air. Onaka starts to smolder as ash sloughs off of him. There's a close-up of some crispy skin woochie applied to the actor's back. It's pretty cool. He grabs a cop's pant leg as he's doubled over on the ground, pleading for help as his face blisters and peels. The officers mill about, confused, and only just starting to panic. So they rough up their extra crispy in spite of his tears victim. Redneck logic. When in doubt, punch it. Still not sure? Punch it again. (laughs) He even reaches out to Token McGruff for mercy, only to be spurned by a look of mild revulsion. Eczema's bad, okay? As the only black guy in authority, he should have seen the hypocrisy. With not being the victim this time, I'm sure it was a bit of relief for Token. The one time in the movie when he's not a victim of his own stereotypes. Oh, Knuckles is not taking this as well as Nissa did in Blade 2. Especially since she blows away gracefully while Onaka explodes messily. Spontaneous combustion activate! Though it's more just ash and a bunch of latex scraps, maybe some masonry too. His vampire dog master escapes down into the underground as the cops dust themselves off and throw up a little. They have a moment like Tom Cruise in War of the Worlds, realizing he's covered in people ash. Gordon Bennett, yes, Chen, everybody, everybody's dead, Dave. Think of the savings on crematoriums. Token points out that the sun did it. They say it's the perfect weapon. And he points out again, yeah, just until it goes down. What was he basing that on? What if he has just severe allergies and was using Smenadryl? That stops sniffles and itching, but has a side effect of severe sensitivity to sun? They're not our sponsor anymore. An officer, with vomit down his front, hears something else explode outside of the gate to Midian. Noticing a plume of smoke, he calls for Patine. Token barks, Who did it? Cut to Narcissus, driving away in a beat-up old car with spray-painted windows, laughing, wearing shades, with a veiled woman, Conspiracy Gypsy, in the back seat. Back at the station, we round up the posse. We switch to Captain getting a call from the party at Midian about the bombed-out car that they're still able to make a call from? Yes, somehow, Patine is standing in front of the driver's side door with the cord for his intercom going in through the window. That looks so unsafe. That's when the captain goes to get the priest and says, Reverend Ashbury, your services are required. Why? What possible reason could the cops need a drying out priest for a raid on Hobo Town? Decker points out that he looks like a drunk. Captain confirms that he is a drunk and pulls the priest up by his lapels. He tells him the apocalypse is coming and he needs him to bring all the religious accoutrements they've got since they're going with God on their side. Funny little bit of invoking the Crusades or Inquisition here. Much like the one pictured in Babette's vision of the Nightbreed's darkest hour. Then they call the locals who bring guns and gas, hooting and shooting into the air. That's a good idea. Then we get the armory scene with Officer Kane, who looks like Egon Spangler, you know, Harold Ramis, where he gives them their loadout options. He shows them an automatic rifle and a little shotgun that Decker compliments but passes up, not taking any weapons. Possibly because we know that in his briefcase he has more knives than a Ginsu salesman. All police-
many stations in Canada have such an armory? I thought we were the kill happy ones. <laughs> Lori arrives amidst the din as Officer Egon is showing off his lucky garrote, going so far as to pluck it with his lower lip. Captain calls the nightbreed commies, freaks, and third world Y chromosome mutants. The jailer chides Boone through the slit that they've found their friends and are going to fry him. The posse drives off to Midian, hollering and shooting away. Because that makes so much sense. Yeah. Commies? Really? Commies? I like third world Y chromosome mutants, so that was funny. But where did he get commies from? They kind of live in a commune. <sighs> Exit posse. Enter Narcissus and Rachel for an old-fashioned breakout. The rusted heap with chrome thumbs and conspiracy gypsy is there to save the day. Lori gets in and they tell her they need to get Boone. He's special because he survived visiting the tabernacle. They think Baphomet told him something that could save Midian. Inside the station, some cops are sharing some booze from a flask when Narcissus taps on the glass of the front door. As the cop goes to the door, he pulls out his piece. Oh. Why? Wasn't he just sampling some liquid courage? Are you some kind of coward? Maybe he should have been more cowardly, because Narcissus reaches through the glass and pulls the cop outside a bit before throwing him back in. Apparently they're drinking the good stuff, because our cop who was still at the counter is slowly sipping his booze and only puts it down after our airborne panty waist tries to stand up again. They brawl a bit, but Narcissus is way stronger than he looks. He's just smiling under that straw hat and shades while chewing his gum. He he subdues the guy with the flask and gets him to say where Boone is. Follows it up with, I love a coward. The other cop draws his gun, goes into the back and triggers an alarm. Chides Boone some more, for some damn reason, and sees smoke filtering in through the keyhole with a nice swirling effect. I think the chiding was more to bolster himself since he was about to wet his pants. The jailer shoots three times into the mist and accidentally kills the other officer that was there. Brilliant. Rachel reforms from the mist and emerges, nude and glistening slightly, walking confidently towards the jailer. That was condensation, right? Is that how she reforms? She cups his gun in her palm gently and lowers it, saying she doesn't want to hurt him. She kisses him until he collapses, smoke trailing from his mouth as he slumps to the floor. She is that hot! Or is she a water elemental? Rachel then lets Narcissus and Lori into the jail. At least Cabbage Patch was nice enough to bring her something to wear. Lori wants to go into Boone's cell first, and Narcissus calls her a brave girl. Boone's passed out in a corner, looking so much like Buffy's angel. She wakes him, but he says to stay away. She says she's not afraid. And they suck face until he gets a little rough, grunting and letting his sigils slip out. I think this is a callback to that crappy song she was committing on stage. He is acting very much like a caveman here. Agreed. Narcissus tells them there's no time for hoochie-coochie. Now we rejoin the posse driving to Midian as the priest reads from the Bible, Numbers 31.10, about Moses talking about attacking Midian. The captain is taking this reading as a prediction on what he is about to face. Again, the original Midian was in the Middle East. You know, where the Crusades were? and was filled with the descendants of Abraham. That's when the priest says he doesn't believe in the devil. Can you still be a priest if one of your core characters in your doctrine you consider a myth? Really, just pick one, any main character, and decide they were not real, and then try to resolve all the cognitive dissonance with all the other characters. No sooner than they step inside the gates of Midian, they start shooting up parts of the scenery, boldly giving up any element of surprise as they stomp around and plant claymores in the topiary. What are they shooting at? The statuary in the cemetery? That's so rude! The priest almost sets off a claymore while looking to tell Captain there's nothing evil here and that blowing it up would be sacrilege. He looks a lot like Ted Stryker from Airplane. Stryker. Stryker, 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 Stryker! Stryker! <gasps> he will later have a stronger drinking problem. But for now, he gets knocked down by the captain and is told to leave. Called a pinhead. Made me think of Bill O'Reilly, who called everybody a pinhead at some point and had the same militant disposition. They step over him on the way out, saying those claymores would have cut his nuts off faster than a hedge clipper. The cops and rednecks amble out giddily, trailing bridge wire to their explosives. Boone, Narcissus, Lori, and Rachel are now all in the rustmobile and speeding back to Midian as this is going on. Bacon Angel, Chrome Thumbs, Cabbage Patch, and Conspiracy Gypsy. Your nicknames take longer to write. 
text-to-speech, biatch. Do not doubt the dragon. Decker is looking longingly into his briefcase in the passenger side of a truck. His gimp mask ogles back from amidst the collection of knives. Damn it, I was half right about the case. No horsehair butt plugs. Disappointed. Decker slashes Detective Token in the arm after talking him into looking into the briefcase. Why did he die? It was his arm where he got hit. It's just a flesh wound. Come on, he's black. The Black Knight always triumphs. You've never seen a horror movie with a black person in it. Also, I love the agonizingly slow and sheathing of the straight razor he used. It squeaked as it slid free. <laughs> the hicks hook up the plunger and count down from five. Because professionals don't need to count from a higher number for safety's sake. Surely nobody is left behind in the explodey place. Just like we're going to leave you all behind for a quick intermission in the form of an interstitial skit. Welcome to the Caveat Hemptorium, purveyors of exciting artifacts and powerful items that grant occult powers. I'm afraid we're fresh out of anything that can be used as a weapon in the traditional sense due to the events transpiring in this unusually boisterous burg. You may either bow before your empress or simply show me to your assorted glow sticks, peon. And be quick about it, Scallywag. This is the Empress Rana Yaga. I am her consort, and we are missing a killer rave. I'm sorry to say we have no glow sticks. You clearly have no idea what's actually happening outside and need to either buy something or go. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was also part of the rave. Raid, actually. Oh, oh, that's very different. You cad! The Empress has come dressed for a rave, and by the seven stars, I will have satisfaction! And maybe that cool-looking hoodie over there. There are more than seven stars, and your accent is horrendous. rum tongue hugger no it isn't! I've been listening to Ricardo Montalban on an endless loop. My accent is flawless! I do hate to trample your self-image, however, I am trying to run a curiosity shop, and your tail keeps threatening to topple something. Daryl, have you forgotten a little bit of cosplay etiquette we've been working on? No, I know. Clerk smiles back, keep your mask, but if the host scoffs, take it off. Good. Now shut up and look for cool swag or unique kitsch. This is that place I had told you about. Oh yes, from the commercial. Sigh, good times. Please don't take your time. I'd rather not explode today. Also, I just remembered that I don't sell anything to LARPers as it is, so you might as well leave. Hey, I'm technically just a Hispanic pirate cat stuck in a human man's body. Then stuck also in a Hispanic pirate cat suit. So, got a back room? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yes, as it happens, I have some items to risque for the main showroom. Good instincts. Have you got a spiel? I want to hear the spiel for the champagne room. No, I'm not going to do a spiel. I already established this is the quintessential magic curio outlet this side of time and space. Why advertise the back room? There's just a bunch of magical dildos and bongs. I'm not going to say, Welcome to the Caveat Emporium's back room, purveyors of exciting bongs and powerful marital aids that will grant occult powers. You had me at dildos and bongs. These were all enchanted in some way. More or less. They're usually cursed, sometimes possessed, and a handful employ esoteric alien technology. More than a few were forged by demons of one kind or another. I like this one. Wow, it it looks like it's resizing itself to fit. That's amazing. It's fine, so long as you don't mind the curse on it. What's the curse? Even when it fits perfectly, there's always a bit of anal leakage. I... Came. Already? Prepared. Let me finish. Oh, Smetadrill. Like a fire hose full of stew. Welcome back to the final chapter of our visit with the Nightbreed, just in time to witness the fate of Midian. 
This is gonna stain. The plunger drops, and everything explodes. We see Dr. Gosh slinking about, looks kind of surprised by the gout of flames from the cemetery. Rachel in the car says they're too late. It looks like they're starting to strike the set from the film early. There's a brief shot of Peliquin sitting in an archway, hyperventilating. More explosions, including the sun, since now it's late at night? Yeah, shit starts caving in. Midi Knights look frightened and misshapen. Hey, no body shaming. What? Someone drives his truck through the gates, which they could have just blown off. Then, Pell jumps onto the truck and mugs at the driver through the windshield. This is apparently Pell's power, besides the bite that mocks death. His dreadicles become fully engorged, and his open maw elongates like the mummy. That would be so he can swallow eggs whole. I would not recommend a power source larger than your own head, though, as it is against the evil overlord rules. Number 22. No matter how tempted I am with the prospect of unlimited power, I will not consume an energy field bigger than my own head. Unless you're an egg-eater snake. He throws Pell off the car and runs him over before driving into a ditch that ends up dropping the vehicle into the heart of Midian's web of rope bridges, where it explodes at the bottom of a shaft. Does Geico cover that? For the people that are on the bridge, does that count as a hit and run as the vehicle plummets to the bottom of the bit? And it's too damn late for Boone to stagger through the front gate of Midian, but that doesn't deter him. Lori runs up and is noticed by Dr. Pecker. Down below, Lylesburg, the fish, tells his people to stay below ground. But then Boone appears and disagrees, telling everyone it's time to evacuate and fight. So the plucky young hero shows up to save the day. How original. Beastmaster was more inspiring. He also wants to move Baphomet, which can be done, apparently. The Hicks wander into the flaming midden, er, Midian, and open fire with their entire arsenal. Panic ensues. The priest moons about dejectedly, looking at the carnage, closes the eyes of a dead green guy. There's a guy with giant longhorns on his baseball cap. Not practical headwear for a shootout. And, all right, let me get this straight. If they're part of your hat, it's just fine. But if you have real horns attached to your head, you're inexcusable. It's fucking double standard. Dr. Gosh starts chasing Lori into Midian, and Boone shows the Midianites how to arm themselves by breaking up some coffins. Then he also takes a shotgun off some guy and shoots another, saying that, If not for yourself, do it for your children. Good strong family values message there. And this is also a well-established manner in which to steer a mob in any direction you like. Convince them that there is an other that are monsters and that you need to end them before they end you. Textbook humanity. The holy prerogative of prevenge. Midian Underground is breached by rednecks who gun people down. Dr. Gosh, Narciss, and Lori meet below, but Lori keeps running while Narciss gargles phlegm at Dr. Gosh like an alpha male. Couch Patch randomly falls through a sinkhole and lands in a pile of ancient rags, sees some people getting shot, and then wanders across a collapsing rope bridge for no apparent reason until she locks into finding Babette. She rescues the tiny little ginger from a pile of debris. A redneck finds them and pumps his shotgun, aiming at them and saying, It's my lucky day. To shoot a little kid? What a dick. Yeah, not a good hunter. He then drops his gun and starts to smolder from the chest. Rachel reforms from her mist and reaches her hand through his chest before pulling it back out so she can hug her daughter. Topside, we get gun-happy cop Patine, Poutine. Who is about to shoot a bunch of mutants, including some kids. Mutant is such a harsh word. I mean, when it comes down to it, many of them are just not traditionally beautiful. So essentially, this is a wipe out the super ugly campaign. Too bad Boone isn't as concerned about setting a good example because he just shows up and snaps Patine's neck right in front of the kids. Then we see the captain lighting his cigar with some debris as a man in a straitjacket tries to stagger away into the night. But the captain shoots him in the back with his magnum. Father Ashbury pleads that Captain Cigar stop his rampage, but he turns and shoots someone else. The priest holds a snub nose revolver on him and yells, You're killing children! So, if the priest kills the captain, does he become in charge, like in Riddick? You keep what you kill? The captain stares him down and says, Go ahead, faggot, before taking his gun, shoving him down, and getting ready to shoot him in the head with a, Sorry, padre. Boone saves the priest with a flying jump kick, and tells him, We don't like priests here. Run! 
Ashbury takes off his collar and says, No, I have to see. Take me with you. Cut to Armory Officer Kane shooting a guy as one of his cohorts gets a dart in the back of his neck. They look to a nearby archway where Sassy, the bare-breasted porcupine lass, is plying her feminine wiles. Kane goes in for a closer look, so we will too. Sassy is naked except for a red sheet she has wrapped around her like a sexy sarong. Her front is bare down to a little past her navel, and there are dark brushstroke markings on her non-spiny parts. Her face looks like Voldemort's inflatable love doll with porcupine quills instead of cornrows. Hair plug technology has come a long way. The backs of her hands and arms are sheathed in the same quills that run down her back as she coyly goes back behind the archway with heavy breathing and lip licking. The officer who got shot in the neck perspires and passes out, flecks of yellow foam on his lips. But Kane doesn't notice and instead follows Sassy into the dark. She teases him as he peels off her sarong. She flicks her quills, pinning Kane's glasses to his face before running out of the cove to stick a third officer. Fun fact, that is not how quills work. They are not projectiles and cannot be flung by porcupines. But they are very coarse hairs that have between 700 to 800 barbs on each quill and is currently being studied to improve our medical tech for needles and sutures. But this porcupine has thumbs and feminine wiles and a teflon sarong. Cut back to Captain Agerman now with an assault rifle, gunning people down. His gun just keeps growing. The gun keeps growing because it's been watered with blood. Feed my arms. Boone goes back down on the ground and is being followed across a rope bridge by Ashbury. They find Lyleberg cowering in the catacombs and see a vision of Midian exploding within the chalice of Baphomet's glowing, boiling blood. Light soup of doom. Boone suggests releasing the berserkers and convinces Lylesburg by reminding him that they're all the tribes of the moon. Belly Snakes, a.k.a. Tony Bluto as Leroy Gom and Devil Lude, covered in a blue-black lacquer with dainty fangs and curling devil horns, wearing a festive silk jacket that makes him look like a matador. Those two join the fray as a couple of officers are pummeling and shooting people as if they were from Georgia. Leroy tells Devil Lude to get the big one, then mumbles, sucker, as he runs off. Lude gets into a brawl with the big guy. Well, he flails at him a few times, swinging wildly over the natural's head. Eventually, he gets a headbutt in. It's a useful technique if you've got functional horns. Belly Snakes, or Leroy, faces down a hick with a shotgun and says, You don't want to do that. The hick says, Give me a good reason. And Leroy says, I'll give you two. Ugh. Belly Snake's banter is like the Black Saturn. Gotta love the use of prosthesis here, too. Tony Bluto is wearing some kind of glistening, pale pseudo-belly to match his already albino-esque complexion. There's a slit in each side as if he'd just woken up in a bathtub full of ice and gnawlins. The tentacles that come from his slits are each tipped with an eye that has three teeth. His gut snakes are striped like the sandworms from Beetlejuice. Nice fucking model! So after Leroy releases his belly snakes, they gore out the redneck's eyes. I thought he'd be thinner with a case of tapeworms that bad. Leroy rejoins Devil Lude, who is playing with the heap of flesh that used to be his opponent off screen. Leroy looks over his shoulder and says, Ugh, what a mess. More explosions. Lylesburg is putting his pendant, a cross intersecting an M, actually the key for the berserker's cage, into a stone relief of... The Star of David. He starts turning it when a redneck with a laser-sighted rifle calls him Moses. I'm willing to acknowledge a strong body of evidence suggesting that the Nightbreed aren't just the tribes of the moon, they're also one of the lost tribes of Israel. Which really puts into perspective Babette's vision of the Crusaders, as well as their distrust of priests. But anywho, the redneck trains his beam on Lalsberg forehead and caps him where the third eye should be, leaving his body to dangle from the chain attached to the key. Then, a flying stop-motion manta ray monster swoops down the corridor and eats the sniper's face as it zips by. Of course it would, uh, yeah. Then we get a close-up of Lalsberg's face as he gasps out his last breath. His cheek gills open up, revealing that they were, in fact, Eyelids covering crimson irises. Boone arrives and removes Lylesburg's corpse from the keychain. I just want to note that here they missed an opportunity to do the classic closing someone's dead eyes for them trope, but with four pairs on the same face instead of just one. 
Boone then turns the key that sets the Berserkers free and ends up face to lumpy face with the twisted and hulking Berserkers. They're like a litter of little Rancor whelps. But he only panics a little and pulls himself up over the doorframe so the horde can lumber by. These loping tumor apes are actually humans who agreed to accept money in exchange for running around in front of a camera while wearing at least 40 pounds of latex, makeup, and padding that took no less than an hour to get sealed into. So they're not fast. But they are skilled at wreaking havoc. The berserkers literally burst out of the ground, punching free of the earth like the zombies in Thriller. One even goes so far as to grab a redneck's nuts to help pull himself out of the soil. Y'all won't be needing these no more. The berserkers come out and attack only the naturals, even going so far as to use team tactics. So, not so uncontrollable as they rescue a group of non-berserker nightbreed, one of whom, bare-breasted but for Mardi Gras beads and body paint, scoops up some blood from their tormentors and smears it across her nipples, moaning sensually before taking a taste. The berserker prove with a mouthful of marshmallow fluff slowly lurches out a trooper with a flamethrower. The flamethrower jams, but the sap it's strapped to stumbles back into some burning reeds, catching fire himself and blowing up. That's the second person to explode in this movie. The remaining posse flees, but Captain tries to stop them, calling them all cowards, and going so far as to attempt to fire his now empty pistol at them, which is really shitty. Yeah, pretty shitty. He throws the pistol down in frustration and screams, I'll kill you all! And again, he's talking to his own people here. Ooh, can I vote for him for mayor? I would like to be able to, and then pointedly not. Uh, he's already our president. Also, he reminds me of a young Greg Gianforte. The Berserker chases Captain away. So much for that unquenchable valor. The Berserkers also keep trashing shit, now going so far as to flip a few cars. So they're at least as powerful as five inebriated students or sports fans. Some plaid-sleeved wonder pulls out a rocket launcher and fires it at the Berserkers. They don't even have to move as the projectile goes in between them all and blows up an officer in a truck instead. How do you miss with a bazooka? Every good rocketeer knows you aim at the feet. How do you miss with a bazooka? And if you shoot at your own feet, it's called rocket jumping. Maggots! Back underground, Pell looks to have a wound in his chest, but it doesn't keep him from hitting on Lori before showing her the prophecy. Oh, any port in a firestorm for a fishman. He didn't believe the prophecy was real until it started to come true. He tells her about the bite that mocks death. And what must that do to his meals? Would it resurrect his sushi? Wouldn't eating sushi already be cannibalism for a fish man? He was already willing to eat a man, so that might not be a taboo for him. He does, however, regret creating Boone by granting him immortality. Topside, Gosh and Boone meet up as Gosh tosses him the head of Narcissus. Dr. Gosh is wielding a pair of blades, Florentine style, possibly a machete and a crude carood. While Boone is barehanded, he does have one advantage. He's better dressed for a brawl, especially since he's not wearing a burlap gimp mask. Gosh and Boone fall into Midian to fight on some crumbling rope bridges. Boone lands on Gosh, who plays dead, so he can throw his carood at Boone's back as he's staggering away. Boone gets skewered, at least five inches of the implement protruding from his chest and his back, but this just seems to piss him off. Or it gave him a moment to take a hit, because when the camera cuts to his face, we see smoke trailing out of his mouth and nose before he roars. They tussle some more as Lori enters. Boone gets thrown onto a card table, so now there's an ace of hearts impaled on the blade sticking from his chest. Are you fucking kidding me? Boone hits him with a mirror as Gosh charges, then staggers Gosh by beating him with a femur. And as he's teetering on the edge of a precipice, Boone grabs him and rips off his mask before repeatedly impaling Gosh on the steel jutting from his own sternum and says, One last dance, before he throws him off the ledge, where he gets skewered on some rubble. Boone eventually finds Lori, whom he tells, Decker's dead. Pull the knife out. Then turns around so she can unkebab him. She braces a hand against his shoulder and pulls it out with little trouble, like the sword from the stoner. There's no way he could have impaled Dr. Gosh on that blade if it was that easy to remove. He was clenching it between his pecs. It's a viable technique. 
so long as you don't have to breathe. Baphomet's voice echoes through the halls, calling Boom's name, which sounds just like someone playing with a megaphone. Boom. Boone says he has to go to the tabernacle and discards the Ace of Hearts still stuck to his chest. Boone and Laurie enter the tabernacle and are followed there by Father Ashbury. Conspiracy Gypsy, Mac Tonight, and others we've never met, one that looks like an Amish werewolf, are draping more gauze on Baphomet? There's no time for gauze. And wait, I thought they made a big to-do about Boone having gone to see Baphomet and being one of the only people to ever survive. What is this party doing around Baphomet and living? Maybe they're getting ready to move him. The statue comes to life and hefts Boone off the floor like a two-year-old. His green glowing eyes open and he tells Boone he was destined to destroy Midian and now must be the one to rebuild it and find Baphomet after Midian is finally nixed. He then dubs Boone Cabal. Huh? Cabal? Cabalism? Pretty ironclad so far. And drops him on the marble with a brand new face tat across his sloping Neanderthalian brow. It glows too. Cabal then leaves with Lori and they take with them my skepticism. The Nightbreed is definitely a lost tribe of Israel. I'm convinced. On their way out, Lori claims a random knife sticking out of a wall. The priest goes to see Baphomet and drops his Bible and crucifix in awe of the spectacle. The remaining Nightbreed are using forked wooden poles to stuff Baphomet's veins back in? Ugh. Ashbury notices the boiling blood chalice and reaches for it as Baphomet sneers at him. And as we found out earlier, this Ted Stryker lookalike also has a drinking problem. So true to form, he splashes some blood all over his face. He falls to the ground, sizzling and wailing as his hair falls out and the cranium deforms. He shouts, What have you done? at Baphomet. Midian Underground starts to explode as Mac Tonight and friends escape with some bundles of Baphomet's parts. Maybe they're clippings. Can you regrow your god in some soft soil? Or a petri dish, like the Klingon Jesus, Kalash? There's some next-gen lore for you. No time to find out, as someone just set off a bunch of fireworks on set to finish striking it. Then the whole model explodes as Boone and Lori make it out of the front gates, with Midian burning behind them. The two of them clumsily stagger up a hill, clearly on a soundstage, the glow from Midian framing their silhouettes as they look back. No smoke. He says he has to move out tonight, and she wants to come with. Boone, nay, Cabal, clearly doesn't want her to come, so he tells her he belongs to the breed now. She wants to belong to, and then asks him to make her one. For all he knows, this complete newbie goth still hasn't had his undead training montage yet. Everybody wants to belong. He then says he can't change her, but he'll come back when his work is done, which she points out is uh, pretty damn nebulous and could take until she's old and gray. So she tells him to just go. But as he's walking away like a sad puppy, she makes him turn around and watch her stab herself in the gut. The actress, Anne Bobby, actually did a great job here of conveying a look of that hurt way more than I was expecting. I'm a woman. I've dealt with cramps. Hurt. <laughs> We exaggerate! He crunches into her neck to save her with his curse and begs that it not be too late. He then screams, No! When it looks like it didn't work. But then she wakes up after all and says, You said you'd never leave me. Fatal frame reference. They kiss on the soundstage, becoming one with each other as well as the horizon. Back in the ruins of Midian, Captain Igerman meets the rebaptized priest, Ashbury, who is standing at a makeshift altar going through the motions of lighting incense and performing some sort of sacrament. Ashbury says, I saw their god. He's out there. I can still smell him. The captain says, They can get them together. But Ash says, No, they're mine. I gotta burn them back. Burn them to ash. Burn them all away. The captain turns back to face him and pleads in a weak voice, Take me with you. Ash grabs him by the throat and uses his newfound super strength to press him against the shrine and crush his throat before walking away. In the theatrical cut, Ashbury actually resurrected Dr. Gosh to become an undead slasher. I know it's cheesier, but I still like it. Cut to a remote barn in the middle of the night where Midian's survivors wait for Boone and Lori. We see Mac tonight, Peliquin, Rachel, Babette, as well as a bunch of others, like Candy Corn Hand Chin Girl. Babette says Boone will come for them, and Mac reminds her his name is Cabal now. Rachel says he'll arrive on the next wind. 
cut to Boone and Lori standing on the same hill, staring moodily into the distance. As we transition to the cave painting of Boone and Lori standing on the hill with the stars in the background. Then we get a little placard uh, just for the director's cut that says, My love and thanks to Mark Miller and all those who have made this happy reunion possible. Clive Barker. Mark Miller produced the director's cut of this film. Roll credits. Now that we've picked Nightbreed apart, what did we find while stirring about in their entrails and ashes? We found four lonely minorities in an ocean of white, Detective Token McGruff, whose authority was often ignored entirely, who sneered at Onaka's pleas for mercy, and who was killed by Dr. Decker before any of the chaos at Midian could go down, cut loose from life like some barely noticeable hangnail, an ignominious end for one who carried the bulk of the non-Caucasian screen time. Thankfully, Hugh Corshi has had much better roles since. There was also the morgue assistant who had a few seconds and even fewer lines. He was in every way an extra. Keep fighting the good fight, Lindsay Holiday. There was a night breed that looked like Greedo. We only see him a couple of times, but he could be a black actor. And that same ambiguity goes for Baphomet as well. I still have no idea about the actor who plays him. Bernard Henry, according to IMDb, his skin was onyx. We only ever see him move when his eyes open and his mouth moves in close-ups. Aside from those four, there were some clues that say the Jews were behind it all, just like every other crazy conspiracy out there. We counted four stars of David. Stars of David Cronenberg, that is. We also got one paraphrased reading of an Old Testament passage relating to the original Midian. One reference to the leader of the Nightbreed as Moses. And visions of the Spanish Inquisition. So, jump scares. Got it. Are you ready to guess the conspiracy? Is it, um, that certain geopolitical powers have been ethnically cleansing the lost tribes of Israel, a.k.a. the tribes of the moon, wherever they turn up? And in order to escape the persecution, they stay hidden to perpetrate the masquerade that such beings don't exist? Yep, and it's just as World of Darkness flavored as it sounds. With a drizzle of Freak Legion and a dollop of Vampire the Masquerade. Don't forget that Baphomet was also a pivotal part of the plot and is often associated with the Knights Templar. Right. Because what good is a conspiracy without a hazy connection to the Masons? So the Templars worshipped Baphomet, who is the powerful patron of the Lost Tribes of Israel. That means the Templars defied, I guess, the Pope and helped some of the Nightbreed escape. And now that Lylesburg is dead, Cabal is the Nightbreed's new... rabbi? I've never seen anyone look less the part of an undead rabbi than Bacon Angel. My name's Cabal now. God! Speaking of people you might be surprised are Jewish, David Cronenberg was also in a short film in 2007, at the suicide of the last Jew in the world in the last cinema in the world. <sighs> Which may have secretly been a plea for the cinematic resurrection of Dr. Decker who comes back to life, like in the theatrical cut. And then, ooh, they can make a shaky alliance where he helps Boone find Baphomet so they can establish a new Midian. Just so Dr. Gosh can slash him apart and baptize himself and go on a rampage as an undead super slasher. Sounds awesome. Only problem is there's no sequel or TV spinoff. So we'll never get to see if our pet theory pans out. Unless you read the comics. Cheater! That's how you knew everyone's name! I'm the cheater. You've seen the original theatrical cut where Decker comes back to life. I refuse to read the comics now. The Nightbreed fight the Cenobites. Minion, fetch! Where are they? Shut up and take my... Money. Okay, I'm ready to talk about the transformation. We've got some genuine shapeshifters in this one. Well, some of them transformed a bit. Mm. Most appeared to simply be deformed in some way. Hey, I said no body shaming on those that don't deserve it. They are non-standardly appearanced or rich in facial character. Ugh. Okay, that's easy enough since the normies in this were supposed to be either bloodthirsty inbred Gentiles or their victims. At least the Nightbreed were more interesting and better actors. Overall, it was just people being people and dealing with bigotry. The fact that they were actually being made to be the monsters that any other group is made out to be makes them very interchangeable. 
Hence why I feel the use of transformation by the characters is more of a can he do a backflip kind of thing instead of being pertinent. And at no point did anyone really need to change to do anything. Except Conspiracy Gypsy. She was effective with her mist form. She turns into mist and back several times. Wants to rip a hole in some guy's chest from the inside out. Yeah, that's pretty fucking effective. And then there's her daughter. Yep, Babette does turn from a were-muppet back to a little girl. But a werewolf who's allergic to sunlight is only a fraction as mixed up as the breed's gift swap grab bag of powers. Put all your favorite gothic monster archetypes as well as some weird esoteric ones into a blender. There you go. We get several instances of exhaling smoke that lets you appear slightly different. Boone and Peliquin both did this dankification at several points. Boone getting arcane scratches and swirls as well as pale skin, red eyes, and sharpened canines. Perhaps he got other more impressive enhancements that could not be shown on a non-adult film. <laughs> Peliquin Predator. got all his teeth sharpened, a bigger mouth, thicker tentacles, and a more colorful complexion when he got dank. The transformations here may have been a bit weak, but they make up for it by having them breathe it back in by reversing footage of them exhaling the smoke. I'm suddenly wondering about that cat woman we saw briefly. Do you think she sheds when she changes back to her walking around form, or is she permanently just an anthro cat? Yeah, they don't go over it. Besides them, the emo priest Ashbury becomes a super strong albino Klingon after getting splashed with Baphomet's blood. And of course, Baphomet himself, perhaps as a statue that is occasionally animate. All in all, the spirit of transformation was mighty in this one, even if the actual screen time and special effects given over to the process were a bit underwhelming. Okay, after taking all that into account about Clive Barker's director's cut of Nightbreed, how cheesy was this movie as a whole? I have to say, it was quite a monster. It's recognizably cheesy, has lots of flavor, and is off-puttingly elastic under the right conditions. I also appreciate Munster's subtle taste, like the use of transformation. I see what you did there. And since you stole the cheese with the most appropriate name, I'm going to give this movie a score of Nacho. It's fun, occasionally spicy, and looks as neon yellow artificial as you can get while still allowing the word cheese on the label. The cheesiness was in direct proportion to the lack of nuanced social commentary. And we might as well end it with cheese and a cliffhanger, as that's it for episode three of the Shifty Bastards podcast. But before we strike the set with flamethrowers and bazookas, let's tease next month's movie. We'll be migrating south to the opposite hemisphere to land in Africa for our next review of Something Shifty. In episode 4, we're going to watch District 9 to explore the Chernobyl-esque beauty of, of an extraterrestrial concentration camp outside the largest city in South Africa, Johannesburg. Here's one of my personal favorites. It's got super expressive aliens, overt racism, heavily armed mechs, cannibalism, and... I'm going to try to do a South African accent. Please don't. Which we will watch in the hopes that it does evolve into a masterpiece. If you enjoy our flavor of madness, please consider hurling your loonies in our direction at patreon.com forward slash shifty bastards. You'll get the patron-only extended editions complete with bloopers, outtakes, deep cuts, and special readings and other delightful detritus. Can't scrape together the ducats? How about helping us out with a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher? You can also find us on YouTube and SoundCloud. Want to get in touch with the Shifty Bastards to correct our vocabulary? Gush about your favorite transformation media? Or scold us about our scandalous emissions? Then we encourage you to tweet at Shifty Bastards on Twitter. Thanks to Clive Barker for creating a love letter for those deemed monsters. Thanks to Yaga for suffering through a cold while recording as my amazing co-host for this episode. Thanks also to the selfless Afro-Deutsch for their germanely Germanic generosity. The music used in this episode was Summon the Rock and Run Amok by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com and was licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license before being callously cut and crimped by myself. Until next time, this is Yaga and Crafty signing off and reminding you to, to stay, stay shifty. shifty.
The preceding podcast was a production of Meteor Press, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.